everyone! Happy New Year! And welcome to Through Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. And today we have our first episode of 2022! Yeah! Yeah! Um, and as always, as sort of our, uh, our, our special, you know, ring-in of the new year, we are doing a roundup. That is the 2021 roundup. Where, if you remember from our last roundup, we, we each cover 10 stories from the past year that were exciting or notable or unique, and we kind of run through them relatively briefly. It's kind of like a flashpoint headline news sort of style. Mm -hmm. Before jumping into our regular news programming for the last month of 2021. But uh, before we jump into that, uh, Albert, how have you been doing? How was your New Year's? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's uh I guess it's been a while uh since uh we've uh, done an episode at all because uh, of course we had the the holidays at the end of um 2021 and then New Year's. Um so yeah, I've been doing fairly well. Um of course our last uh, episode was our Paleo Rewind video which uh got quite a lot of views by our standards. Um so thank you everybody who checked it out and thank you everybody who decided to subscribe afterward. Um and I uh, hope you all enjoyed it and hope you will continue enjoying our content. Um, but uh, as far as how I've personally been doing, um, I guess my biggest thing uh, is that I uh, submitted my thesis. <laughs> um, at the Pretty much at the very, very end of December, I sent it off um, to a university. And so what's going to happen now is that it's going to... Um, go to my examiners, who are basically the people who are going to read my thesis, and then uh, eventually we're all going to um, schedule a time to meet together. Well, meet uh, in these days means like meet online over Zoom or, or something similar. Um, but uh, in any case, we're, we're all going to we're all going to meet and uh, they're going to ask me a lot of questions about my thesis and why I did the research that I, um, the way I did. Um, and uh you know topics related to the research and such so that'll be exciting i guess um and that'll basically be the the main thing i need to pass before i can receive my phd degree so yeah exciting times ahead and um submitting a thesis was a big weight off my back because as i was saying throughout basically all of last year i was just working and working and working on thesis just um doing the research and also writing the thesis itself um and so yeah you know, i'm glad to be done with that um but uh in the meantime uh you know, i i have other things that i'm busy with um so i am actually still in the middle of kind of um kind of polishing off uh, one of the chapters of my thesis uh, so that it can be published as an actual scientific paper. So um, I've actually already published um, uh, most of the chapters in my thesis as papers, as like in like actual scientific journals. But uh, my very final chapter, the last one I did, um, I haven't had a chance to really do that yet because I had to put it into the thesis and finish that. Um, so I been working on that uh, to uh, try and turn that into a paper and uh, also I've been applying to you know, jobs and, and things which is not, not, not a lot of fun but kind of has to be done at this stage. Um, so we'll, we'll see how things fall out on that end. Um, and yeah, that, that really is my, my biggest update. Um, otherwise, uh, things were relatively uneventful uh, because of pandemic reasons. I couldn't really uh, get together in person with, with a lot of uh, people. But, um, you know, thing, things still went perfectly fine and I enjoyed myself. Um, and um, if anybody is wondering uh, whether I have been keeping my word about working on the website uh, for through time and clades, the answer is yes. I have been like slowly working on it. Um, however, I just uh, you know, if you consider how much material uh, that we covered in our series, um, in both of our series, like um, kind of writing out all that material uh, in text form and you know, preferably with accompanying graphics is basically tantamount to writing a book. So. Um, it's a lot of work on top of like all the other stuff we do. And so, yeah, I just going to say we are working on it, but, uh, don't expect it to be, um, kind of 
unveiled any time uh, too soon. But yeah, we are doing our best on that front. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I guess uh, that that's my main update. Uh, what about you? Um, yeah, well, I'm definitely with you there. Um, I, I've been doing lots of reading for the website, too. And I'm still finding things that I really have to kind of go back and fix because they're essentially major updates to my series, mm. Humanity of Prologue, um, which has just been like, cracking me up. Like, I, I <laughs> just to let you know, like, I am, I am still learning every day, even if it seems like I have vast amounts of anthropological knowledge. But uh, that, it's a lot of work to kind of get to that point. Um, like, I just found out today that apparently the sexual dimorphism among Preanthropus afarensis, that is Lucy's species, has actually been exaggerated. Mm. Um, and it's actually to the level of modern humans today, which is not that much. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I, I just learned that, so I have to incorporate that now into the, into the new notes. Interesting. But, um, yeah, uh, no, my, my, my New Year's... And my holiday, the holiday season was fairly nice for me. Um, it was probably a little bit less uneventful. Um, mm -hmm. We had like a scare in the family, but thankfully that has, has that has passed, mm -hmm. and we've been working on that um, very diligently. But suffice to say, we ended up having to kind of delay our our holiday celebrations a teeny bit, um, which basically amounts to us having a. a having a New Year's miss, as I call it, with the family, so we, we combined the two holidays. Um, so that all kind of worked out fairly well. Um, but beyond that, you know, my, my, the, the holidays were really nice. Um, it's always kind of good to connect with the family a little bit more and, and connect with friends a little bit more. You know, that, that's the great thing about social media. Um, mm. You know, being able to meet with people without having to meet with people. Um, so, of course, the the Regarding the current pandemic, which is, seems to be going all over the place as of late, um, we're still able to keep in touch without touching each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Guess. laughs> well, I could have worded that a little bit better, but you, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, um, yeah, not really a whole lot to report there. Um, I guess as far as like the biggest things have been just keeping up with my readings, and uh, I've been on sort of a job hunt as well, and... Uh, I think I might be on the horizon of that. Uh, I don't want to jinx anything too like yet, but um, I, I might be employed fairly soon, and cool. so that's been a, a long time coming. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that and working towards that. Um, yeah, really, that's been like what I've been up to. Um, honestly, just thinking about the past year, 2021, has been really big for. For the both of us i mean like this series that we've put together is just it's just been a labor of love and i've really enjoyed it i mean last year uh, let's see we had our, our one year anniversary mm -hmm. and we, we, we've been doing this for more than a year now um you remember our one year anniversary special from august 20th um and like we were both able to complete our lecture series as well mm -hmm. um which we had started late in 2020 um, of course, your series, uh, uh, Dinosaurs, the Second Chapter, and my series, Humanity of Prologue, which were both, you know, tremendous amounts of work. Um, and I think it's safe to say that we're both, you know, really proud of what we've come up with. And uh, we're very grateful that everyone has responded pretty much well to them um, and, and have been learning a lot from them. Mm -hmm. And we're always glad to hear about that. Um but, oh gosh, let's see. The last year. Well, there's been a lot of highlights in terms of, like, the personal side of things. Mm. Um, I guess, uh, Albert, if you want to kind of go through some of your personal brief highlights of the year, what what, what made 2021 special to you? Uh, well, um, that's a good question. Uh, I think... For most part, uh, I think uh, much of my time was pretty much occupied by my thesis, like I described earlier. Um, it really was like the year to finish the thesis. And um, at the very, very end of it, I finally managed to do that. So, um, yeah, I mean, really, that, that really is the biggest thing. And uh, when you're a PhD student, it kind of is the you know, your world is your thesis, really. Um, yeah. I mean, well, I, that, that's obviously a, a bit of an exaggeration. It is, it is not healthy to, like, you know, 
spend absolutely all your time on on your thesis, um, which is why I also do other things like work on the show. But um, even so, I, I think uh, it is fair to say that you know a big chunk of uh, what I was doing and um, how I was living my life was revolving around uh, finishing the thesis. And so, yeah, no, I, I'm glad that I finally uh, was able to complete that. And so um, that was definitely, a, I guess, a big highlight of, of my year. But um, as for other things, um, let me think. Uh, I managed to get one paper um, that I co-authored uh, published uh, last year. Um, it was a paper on um, using the internet for science communication um, regarding specifically the um, annual kind of event, uh, March Mammal Madness, which is a science outreach event that happened on Twitter. I think I, I kind of mentioned on the show when the paper got published and kind of described what yeah. that was all about. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, that was fun. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really um, glad that I got to be a part of that. Um, and uh, what else? Well, I mean, I was also remembering you also had a lot of collaborations with Quartzgazak. Um, You're right. Yeah, really yeah. exciting for the last few. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess I should have mentioned that because um, uh, I, I definitely did have a lot of fun um, working with Kurt Kazat. And I, I also talked about those um, when, as they happened um, on the show, too. So uh, I, I guess I don't have, uh, I, shouldn't, um, I shouldn't go into too much detail about them. But yeah, I, I worked with them on a um, couple posters, uh, one on the Tree of Life, one on um, dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, I also worked with them on their calendar for this year, which um, unfortunately, if you haven't got, gotten one, it's sold out now, so uh, you can't get their 2022 calendar anymore. But uh, in any case, they had a focus on prehistoric life, um, which uh, was lots of fun. Um, and uh, I also helped out with a video they, they put out on um, uh, kind of reconstructing the appearance of extinct animals and what we know and what we don't know things like that so uh yeah lots of lots of great collaborations with them and um oh i i'm really honored that they kind of you know contacted me for uh for help with with all of those and um i i had a really positive experience working with them it I, I think they they really do um make a very dedicated and honest effort to to try and um uh you know listen to my feedback and incorporate um kind of my suggestions um and uh i'm very happy to to have been able to work with them and uh, hopefully you know if they if they decide to do more paleontology related uh, subjects i can get a chance to do so again but yeah i'm i'm, I'm pretty happy with with those <laughs> yeah and I'm, I'm excited about them too i mean i'm, I'm looking at my twelve thousand twenty two calendar right now <laughs> and i'm looking at a wonderful scene of, of the cambrian explosion yes which of course in the quartz kazakh style is very lovely um, yeah, well, let's see. Uh, I guess the biggest thing about 2021 was the fact that we had moved and we'd begun work on our new home. Um, so if many of you might remember from very early in the series, like our first episodes, like the biggest life thing that I was going through was helping the folks try to sell the house because they wanted to build their dream home on a new patch of land that they had them bought. And... So by February of 2021, we were able to sell the house at record time. Um, of course, all the details are there in those episodes if you want to learn a little bit more about that, um, which was you know the delight of all of us. And so, of course, that meant that, okay, well, now we have to find a new place to live while we you know start building the house. Um, and so in March, we were able to move into an apartment complex where I am speaking to you all right now. Mm -hmm. um, and took a lot of getting used to but we're all kind of settled in now at the moment i mean we we make it as cozy and as home-like as we can and we, we're pretty used to it um but i know we're, we've all been very antsy about getting construction started so like over the course of the year since march you know we had been doing maintenance work on the land putting the padding in talking to architects and contractors and all this sorts of stuff and I think now, since we are approaching the you know the the next you know, next February, so one year later, um, we are pretty much like getting ready to start building soon. Um, they're about to my folks are about to finalize uh, picking you know construction people to work with and uh, 
I can tell they're very anxious to get started. Mm. You know, they 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 would like us to be moved in by the next go around of holiday of, of holidays at the end of the year. So that'll be the next great adventure. Um, but everything's designed. Everything looks really nice, and uh, they've tailored it very much to their needs. Um, like the, this is basically the house that they plan to spend the rest of their lives in. Mm. So like they're proofing everything beforehand, making right. the doorways especially wide, um, putting ramps and things. Um, as new they get older and it's really exciting i'm definitely looking forward to it and the property is very lovely we have four acres of woodland that we get to explore and just about all the north carolina critters that i read about in the area <laughs> live there Wonderful. which is kind of fun um, every time we would go check on the padding new batches of footprints from deer and foxes and a really huge raccoon at mm. one point um even like little bug prints, which are always kind of fun wow. to see. You see the little, little legs moving. Um, and it's coming along. It's coming along very well. So, for yeah, for much of 2021 in the meantime, it's been just adjusting to apartment life and yeah, really working on the show, working on the website, doing research, doing readings, um, usual pop culture stuff that I always like to get involved in. Hmm. And yeah, I mean, Pandemic, what? Uh, uh, you know, pandemic. Otherwise, uh, twenty twenty one, I think, was a was a nice year. I, I had a lot of personal pluses there, and uh, I, I'm always, you know, I'm here to look positive into the this next uh, coming year. You know, twenty twenty two. Who knows what's gonna happen? <laughs> it's gonna it'll it'll be a new adventure. You know. Yeah. Fantastic. Um. So we both kind of have some, I don't know if like announcements or like is the right word, maybe cool things to share. Yeah, I guess um, so. <laughs> regarding this, yeah, I guess regarding the series. So if we jump to the next slide, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So um, regarding the photo on the left, this is one of my Christmas presents from my sister Julie, one of our patrons and a big supporter of the show. Um, yeah, this was a nice surprise. She basically made a ceramic ornament of my Killdeer avatar from the show. Um, it was a whole funny story about how, like, the, I got this present, because, I guess just in brief, um, she gave me the box, and she basically recycled an ornament box that we had gifted her for her anniversary, her five-year anniversary. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, she, she got us the same present with maybe a picture of us, and it's really sweet. And she's like, no, 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 the box is just recycling. <laughs> so I'm, I'm opening the box, I'm pulling out the, the little stuffing, and I see these two, like, yellow feet sticks, like, sticking out of the box. And I'm like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And so then I pull it out, and it took me, like, a brief second. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is my avatar. And she was like, yeah. <laughs> Basically, she had taken a, a very brief class on, on, on pottery and kilning, and she had made a whole bunch of like different ceramic ornaments and pieces, very lovely work. And yeah, she had took the time to sneak in a a sculpt of the of the kill deer. And she even got it like with the you know the new design where mm -hmm. I fixed the uh, the underside of the wing. That's right. <laughs> if you all had noticed, we we had it brown for a lot of the early episodes, and then I actually took a closer look at like real Kyoto photos, and I was like, oh, it's white under the wings. Right. Oops. And so we we fix it, you know, we try to keep it scientifically accurate, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I love this ornament, and uh, I, I didn't feel good getting it and then just putting it in a box to wait for next year. Mm -hmm. So I have it hanging in my room, so I get to admire it every day. <laughs> awesome. And, yeah, I love it so much. Um but uh, Albert, I understand you were able to find a really cool treasure, and that's <laughs> what's what's this here on the right? Yeah, sure. Um, but uh, yeah, before I explain that, I, I, I that that's such a wonderful present to to receive um, for you. I mean, yeah, that, it's amazing. But yeah, uh, the thing that I um uh, I recently uh, obtained, um, uh, or rather, something that I recently obtained uh, is uh, pictured on the uh, right over here, and. Uh, you know, if you've been following our show, uh, one of our latest episodes, I think, the, the one that we did just before Paleo Rewind, uh, was us reviewing um, a 1970s anime called The Story of Perrine. Um, and uh, so 
I think I was just um, sort of browsing the internet uh, for Perrine related things, um, as I do now and then. Now, there, there isn't too much out there, because uh, as we kind of mentioned the, in the episode, um, the the show is just not very well known in, in English-speaking uh, regions. And so um, there there isn't a whole lot out there if you Google the story of Perrine. Um, but uh, I did come across a Japanese website um, that was selling uh, some merchandise related to the show. Um, and they, they had all kinds of things. Um, they, For example, they, they had a full box set of DVDs of the entire series. Um, however, uh, like we kind of mentioned in the episode as well, the, those DVDs, um, the full series, um, was about a hundred U.S. dollars in total, um, which is uh, pretty much uh, which pretty much tracks with uh, what we what we had found uh, back when we were trying to see if the DVDs were available anywhere in preparation for recording the episode. Um, however, uh, they were also selling some books related to the show, and one of these books was this one that is pictured here, um, and uh, that is uh, an art book uh, for the series. And so inside uh, are um, uh, concept art um, pieces of many of the characters, uh, many of the notable scenes from the show, uh, some of the scenery and the objects and the animals that appear in the show. Uh, and yeah, that, that was really cool. And the book, unlike the DVDs, was not too expensive. So I was like, oh, cool. Um, <laughs> I'll... I'll just go ahead and order it, <laughs> and um, and I and I did, and uh, I, I guess I, I can I can put the link to uh, where you can purchase it um, in the description um, of this episode uh, in case anybody else is interested. But yeah, it, it is it is really lovely um, uh, little little book. Uh, I mean, in terms of size, like it's it's not all that thick, uh, it's it's pretty thin, but uh, it is um it is pretty large in terms of like the the page area so it does show off the, the artworks quite nicely um and there's very little text it, it is of course um, entirely in japanese um but uh there, there's very little text to begin with uh, most of the pages are taken up almost entirely by the artwork um there are a few pages inside um where that seems to be a transcription of an interview that was done um, with the character designer who did the the artwork in the book, and also with some of the producers of the show. Um, now, of course, I, I don't read Japanese, so uh, I I uh, couldn't really tell myself uh, what exactly was said in the interview. Um, however, um, Joan, you introduced me to a uh, uh, an app, a uh, Google Translate app, that I can actually uh, instantly uh, using text recognition uh, translate like uh, text that you uh, kind of. Um, uh, scan with your with your phone and so I tried that mm -hmm. on the interview and it actually kind of worked um, now it wasn't super the, like the resulting translation wasn't like super fluent um, or, or coherent for that matter but uh, I could kind of get a sense of what was being said um, and there, there were some interesting tidbits there but mostly uh, it was the people talking about uh, uh, working on the show and in, in comparison to working on some of the other um, series in the World Masterpiece um, Theater series, uh, which we also kind of mentioned um, that the story of Perrine is a, a part of in our episode. Um, yeah, and uh, kind of some of the some of the design choices that went into uh, designing the characters. Um, yeah, so something kind of amusing was that apparently uh, the character designer uh, said that uh, Perrine Perrine's design looks like a boiled egg or something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, interesting perspective, um, but yeah, I can I can kind of see it, like like her face, the the shape of her face. Um, so yeah, yeah, an interesting um, an interesting analogy. Um, but in any case, yeah, it, it was a it was a really cool um, find. I'll, I'll just say I, I'm really surprised um, by one particular thing, and that is this book was apparently published in 2019, uh, which is really recent. Uh, wow considering that the show you know came out in the 1970s and so yeah i mean that that's pretty surprising i, I guess that suggests to me that uh the story of Perrine is pretty well remembered in japan um and that there, there that there is demand for such a book even in recent years um so yeah that, that's pretty cool and so you know if anyone else out there uh, has seen the story of Perrine or, or just like you know anime concept art in general um I'll put a link to where you can buy the book 
um, down below. Um, and uh, yeah, you can check that out if you if you like. It is it is really nice, and the, the art style is really lovely. Uh, everyone looks really cute in this in this um, in in this art style. Uh, so yeah, no, it, it's great. I'm, I'm really glad I was able to find it, and because you know, Perrine merchandise is pretty rare as it is. Um, I, I'm pretty pleased with, with this, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy for you too. That's amazing. Um, yeah, like like the very recent publication date for a book like this really reminds me of like what Studio Ghibli has been doing mm. with a lot of their films because um, they've been they have art books like official art books for all of their films, um, but they've been trying to like do one for each of them, even like the really older ones where there wasn't something like that before. Um, like in fact, I, I have the art of Nausicaa, the Valley of the Wind, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorites that they've done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that also came out in 2019. So that's a relatively new book for a film that came out in the in the 80s. Right. So that's really neat. Um, I also just like love the parallels between the two. I guess a lot of like Japanese traditional animation uses a lot of the same processes of uh, of design for their mm -hmm. shows where you have like concept art done in like watercolors for example um which is really lovely uh, a lot of the ghibli films use watercolor too uh, in fact they have like whole books where it's just like the watercolor sketches if that's something that interests you mm -hmm. um that's really exciting yeah um all righty then so now let's go ahead and let's kind of jump into our, our our 2021 roundup stories. Sure. Now, uh, one thing I will mention before we go into it, um, you'll notice that we talk a little bit about Paleo Rewind in this episode, and that's simply because when we were planning the stories to talk about for... Um, Paleo Rewind, of course, we had to... We didn't necessarily have a time limit, but we wanted to try to keep it consistent with everybody else who was putting out their videos. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the great hilariousness of that is during our little part of the year, like, all of our... Pre like, a bunch of the preceding and, and following YouTubers um, kind of went with similar lengths. Yeah. So I think, like... Because of that, like, the total time of all the Paleo Rewind videos um, is something like four hours right. or something along those lines. Um, and we'll, we'll, throw the, we'll throw the link to that here as well for the, 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 total, the total video from mm -hmm. Paleo Rewind if you kind of want to get a, an insider look on that. Um, but, of course, that meant that there were some stories that we wanted to tell, um, but we couldn't really them in the episode after all and we made the difficult decision to um remove them but because they technically count as 2021 stories we have taken those deleted scenes <laughs> and we yeah. have put them here and so we're going to get to talk about them a little bit right so uh yeah that's kind of uh that's kind of our uh announcements for our 2021 roundup uh, albert was there anything you kind of wanted to add about that yeah i guess so um so yeah on the next slide in fact um uh i just wanted to mention that uh, there were a few stories from the paleo rewind um video that we did that um, i probably would have included in this episode um as kind of part of our highlights reel um however since we pretty much just talked about them uh, for Paleo Rewind and in a very similar format to what we're about to do, like, you know, relatively short um, stories um, focusing on, like, images. Um, I decided not to include these particular stories um, in this episode, and so if you want to hear us talk about them, you can go to our Paleo Rewind video, and then we'll, you can hear us uh, mention them there. And so I pictured on this slide um, a story about uh, pellets, uh, basically regurgitated um, uh, prey remains um, from what appears to be troodontid dinosaurs. Um, uh, and uh, there is a new skull of uh, a Mesozoic bird-like dinosaur called Ichthyornis um, that's in the middle there. 
Um, and also uh, on the rightmost side are some bones from a new fossil bird called Archaeodromus, which appears to be a close relative of nightjars um, that are still alive today. Um, and so in any case, um, all of these are very exciting discoveries, uh, at least I think so. Um, but if you want to hear us talk about them, you can go to our Paleo Rewind video and you can hear us talk about them there. Um, and, uh, you know, instead we will uh, open up some more slots for other stories um, in this particular episode. Um, and, uh, yeah, so uh, some of our stories that we would have put in here are actually in Paleo Rewind. And some of the stories that we were going to put in Paleo Rewind will be talked about here, uh, if that's not <laughs> confusing enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, um, in any case, um, I guess we can get started soon, but uh, I'll just preface by saying that uh, in terms of my stories, um, I've mostly, uh, like last year, like what I did last year, I've mostly focused on stories relating to um, new discoveries about um, Manoraptorin paleontology. So Manoraptorin dinosaurs are uh, birds and some of their kind of close relatives. Um, so birds and other bird-like dinosaurs, basically. Um, and so pretty much all my stories are, you know, are about some aspect of Manoraptorans, um, usually Manoraptoran paleontology. There are also a couple of stories about living birds as well. Um, and whereas uh, your stories are a bit more uh, diverse in terms of uh, their, their, their spread, I think, which is also kind of what happened last year. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, for anyone uh, following along, I guess, keep that in mind. Um, in terms of the, the different type of focus that we, that we have. Um, but uh, I could think other than that, um, I, I guess we, we, can, we can jump in soon. Um, so for these particular stories, um, we're going to try to keep our descriptions short. And so uh, I, think, um, I think last year we said to try and stick to under three minutes for each story. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we'll we'll try to make it under two minutes if possible. But yeah, maximum three minutes, and so we'll try to stick to that. Um, so our first two stories, the first two stories that we're going to cover, um, are going to be the stories that we were going to put in Paleo Rewind but cut out, um, and then after that will be kind of all uh, essentially new stories um, that uh, we we picked specifically for this episode. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think um, you have the first story coming up. So uh, do you want to jump in? Yep, that's right. I'll go ahead. So, yeah. Um, so this story is focused on orthoconic or straight-shelled cephalopods, uh, which have evolved from multiple lineages, including nautilids and ammonoids across the Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras. Now, contrary to a lot of paleo art, especially classic paleo art, um, these animals would not have held their bodies horizontally in the water like a squid, um, but would have actually been suspended vertically like an icicle, kind of spreading their arms downward after prey items like plankton. Now, given their unusual lifestyle, there's been a question as to how these animals escaped becoming prey themselves. And this paper sought to answer that question by creating 3D models and tracking their movements through kinematics. So the authors chose to model a species of late Cretaceous ammonoid called Baculites compressus. Now, because the bodies of cephalopods like Baculites were necessarily limited in their movement due to issues of hydrodynamics, their main mode of escape would have been essentially to shoot themselves upwards via a brief jet thrust of their siphon, as cephalopods do. And now this is much more energy efficient than trying to duck out of the way horizontally, which would significantly reduce the chances of escaping, a, say, a hungry mosasaur, as pictured here on the right. Mm -hmm. And it was also found that orthoconic cephalopods were far more likely to survive by taking risks, aka waiting until a predator was much closer than comfortable. Uh, if they had tried to jet thrust ahead of time, then the threat would have you know, very easily changed direction, as is illustrated on the right by right. chance. Now, uh, this modeling study also opens up uh, a much wider window into the overall behaviors of orthoconic cephalopods. It suggests that the average life of an animal like Baculites was spent shooting up and slowly sinking down in the open waters, thanks to a, uh, an overall negative buoyancy in their shells. So uh, if you want to picture these things in life, you can imagine swarms of straight-shelled cephalopods undergoing daily migrations up and down the water column as they filter-fed. Hmm. 
which sounds like a pretty chill life. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, that sounds amazing, uh, except when a Mosasaur shows up. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's really cool. It's always good to get some insight into behaviors of extinct animals, um, especially things that don't often get as much attention, uh, like uh, cephalopods. Um, now, uh, for my story that I cut out of um, Paleo Rewind, um, it was a new study on the anatomy of Scutellosaurus, which is an early armored dinosaur, so from the early Jurassic. Um, and uh, being an armored dinosaur, or thyreophorin, made it a, a close relative of uh, probably much better known uh, stegosaurs and ankylosaurs. And so, this is also the only story that I picked for this highlights reel that is not about a Manoraptoran dinosaur. Um, and so Cygtelosaurus was um, described back in the 1980s, but there hasn't really been a whole lot of new work done on it since then. And so a team of uh, paleontologists decided to um, re-describe the original specimen of Scutellosaurus, meaning that they uh, basically took photographs and also uh, wrote down descriptions of uh, all the different aspects of anatomy that were preserved in, in its fossil. Um, and. Uh, this kind of study uh, can be kind of, you know, dry to lay people. It's just like a, a very detailed documentation of like anatomical features in these animals. Um, however, they are very important to researchers who study these animals um, because since it's been so long, uh, since uh, the, the last time, you know, there was a proper description of Scutellosaurus, uh, a lot of new discoveries about armored dinosaurs and other types of dinosaurs have been made since then. And so uh, kind of taking a new look at these um, you know, relatively old discoveries um, allows us to put them into context of uh, more recent finds and also uh, potentially correct uh, possible mistakes that might have been made by previous uh, authors. Um, and uh, this kind of study is also useful to paleo artists, uh, so who can make use of the uh, new information to create uh, life restorations or more, more up-to-date life restorations of these animals. And so, in fact, uh, these particular uh, researchers actually worked with uh, the paleo artist Gabriel Ugueto to reconstruct Scutellosaurus as pictured on the right here, uh, which is a, a lovely image and it's actually included in their paper. Um, on the left there are um, some armor plates of Scutellosaurus. Uh, so this was, a, this was an armored dinosaur, but a very early one, and probably relatively small, much smaller than a human. Um, and they were able to confirm like many of these aspects of the biology of Scutellosaurus, that it was small, probably bipedal, um, and it was indeed an early kind of armored dinosaur. Um, one last thing I'll mention about this paper is that I kind of picked it uh, for a sort of personal reason, and that's because the lead author on this paper, uh, Ben Breeden, actually went to the same um, undergraduate university that I did, the University of Maryland. Um, and so uh, we, weren't, uh, we weren't there at the same time. He graduated before I started. Um, but still, there is some, uh, you know, solid solidarity there. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And we have, uh, we have since met at uh, conferences and he seems like a cool guy. So yeah, uh, congratulations on the publication, Ben. And uh, uh, it's a really cool piece of work. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you want to go to your next story? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, look, that, that is a really fascinating paper. I, uh, Scutellosaurus is a cool dinosaur. It's, mm -hmm. it's nice that we have we can get more descriptions of its of its biology. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, on the next slide, uh, Albert, you are correct. Uh, I have purposely tried to make an effort to kind of highlight more unconventional organisms in our Nature News episode. You know, we, we can't always have hominins and dinosaurs, even <laughs> though those are our specialties. Right. So, yeah, 2021, well, we had plenty of botanical news last year, um, and that includes this description of a newly recognized lineage of carnivorous plants, which adds to the 11 currently known clades, which includes Venus flytraps, sundews, and pitcher plants, uh, the latter of which is a term that actually constitutes several cases of convergent evolution among plants. So not all pitcher plants are related to each other. Um, our newest member of the club is the Western False Asphodel, or Triantha occidentalis, uh, these are monocots of the mostly aquatic clade Alismatales, and thus distant relatives of duckweed, taro, and eelgrass. Hmm. Uh, you can find this species growing in the continental United States and Canada, along the Pacific Northwest, growing in different wetland environments that are rather nutrient-poor. And as such, it helps to be carnivorous, because 
then that's a source of energy that can't be guaranteed from the soil. So scientific study of the western false asphodel had begun, you know, in the late 1800s when the species was first named, but it was only during the last few decades that suspicion of this particular aspect of biology rose. Uh, this was notably from a 2016 study that detected a gene loss that is common among carnivorous plants within the species. So it was up to uh, Kianzi Lin and colleagues to crack the case officially. Now to do so, they performed an isotopic study on various parts of the plant, including the fruit and stem, and they found that they had taken in nitrogen-15. Now, nitrogen is hard to come by in the wetland environments these plants grow in, but you can get it from insects, of which the nutrient, uh, of which the nitrogen was traced to fruit flies. It turns out that the western false asphodel sports all sorts of sticky hairs along the upper portions of its 80 centimeter tall stem, and it's on these secretion tipped hairs that insects can get stuck, which is similar to how sundews capture their prey, uh, only in this case the, fl the plant doesn't curl the prey into itself to digest mm. it. Um, but from there the insects can get digested and the nitrogen extract. Now, uh, just to add further confirmation, the authors also found that the secretions contain an enzyme called phosphophatase, uh, which is also common in carnivorous plants. So, there we go. Now, uh, given the close-knit location of these wildflowers alongside major cities on the Pacific Northwest, you know, one wonders what other hidden carnivorous plants may be found in the urban areas of the world. Mm. Yeah, that is, uh, that is fascinating. Um, so, uh, let's see what my uh, first story is. Uh, so I actually don't remember what order I put these in, so let's see. Uh, all right, so, um, my, uh, next story, um, is, uh, a, actually a story that we have previously talked about on the show, uh, so that would be our nature news for May 2021, so you can, uh, check that episode for more details about it. But basically, this was a really cool study, uh, where they looked at, um, the anatomy of the sclerotic ring, which is a ring of bone around the eyeball, um, in uh, various kinds of theropods, and also the anatomy of the inner ear in theropod dinosaurs, and then use these to infer uh, what ex which extinct theropods might have been nocturnal. And they found that a particular group of theropods, the alversaurs, uh, which as uh, longtime followers would know uh, are a group of particular interest to me, um, were very likely to have been nocturnal uh, with uh, proportions of the sclerotic ring and the inner ear that are very consistent with um, what we would expect to see in nocturnal uh, reptiles. And so, yeah, uh, this uh, study gave us uh, quite good evidence that alversaurs were a nocturnal group of dinosaurs, and that further adds to their very kind of bizarre uh, biology, um, since they are thought to have been primarily um, insectivorous, uh, insect-eating dinosaurs. And so, yeah, this was an extremely cool study that uh, shed light on a very interesting group of theropod dinosaurs. And just to explain the figure here, um, on top are two skulls of um, different uh, nocturnal theropods. On the um, top left uh, is a modern uh, nocturnal theropod, an owlet nightjar, and on the right is a haplochiris, which is an early alvarosaur, um, whereas on the bottom are the skull of um, a parrot and also a therizinosaur, or lycosaurus. Um, and you'll notice that proportionately the sclerotic ring is much bigger in the nocturnal theropods compared to the two on the bottom, uh, which are believed to be uh, diurnal, uh, being more active during the day. Um, and so, yeah, this was a really amazing study and definitely one of my favorite studies to have come out last year, I think. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I really like this paper. Um, all right, cool beans. Um, so my next story here um, is, pretty, is, is pretty bizarre. Mm -hmm. So there are all sorts of, you know, wacky dietary connections in the animal kingdom. You know, animals that you wouldn't expect another animal of eating. Um, for example, some of my favorites, uh, there's been evidence that's been found of reindeer and moose in the stomachs of the Greenland shark. Um, and then of course, there's critters like Lal, the chicken-eating cow from India. Hmm. And yes, you heard that right. Um, in one month, it was reported that this cow consumed 48 chickens. Um, so th there's a whole story there. 
Um, well, here's another one to add to that pile. Um, Christopher D. Wells and colleagues used DNA barcoding to identify the gut contents of the giant plumose anemone, or Metridium farsenin, uh, which inhabits the eastern Pacific coast of North America. Now, sea anemones are benthic suspension feeders, meaning they filter feed on the sea floor, mostly sifting for plankton, but occasionally snagging a stray fish or shrimp depending on their mood and just engulfing the thing. Uh, this DNA barcoding study did find the usual suspects, copepods, barnacle larvae, crab larvae, polychaete worms, but they also found, surprisingly, ants. And not just a few stragglers, about 10% of the gut contents of this anemone was ants. Now, what are ants doing in the belly of a sea anemone? Well, uh, these belong to the species Lassius pelotarsus, which is the pale-legged field ant, which just so happens to mainly inhabit the seashores on the Pacific coast. Now, during the mating season, as most ants do, they make nuptial flights, and they leave their home nests to found new colonies. And in doing so, these particular ants seem to have been blown off course into the sea, where the tides could pull them further underwater, where their tiny bodies can become mixed with the plankton, and end up right in the mouths of sea anemones. Now, if it wasn't for DNA barcoding, we probably wouldn't have known that this was happening, mm -hmm. which is all the more reason why this sort of new research is full of exciting possibilities. So that's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think something that's uh, often quite underappreciated and very fascinating is uh, kind of these connections between terrestrial and marine ecosystems and how they feed into each other. So yeah, definitely often unexpected um, and uh, super interesting when we learn about them. Now, uh, for our next story uh, is actually a new species of dinosaur, uh, and this is a species uh, from the group Enantiornithes, uh, often nicknamed the opposite birds. These were a group of very bird-like dinosaurs that lived during the Mesozoic. Um, so most of them were very small, like uh, around the size of, say, a sparrow to, to pigeon size. Some of them got bigger than that. Some of the biggest ones that we know have got to about the size of an eagle, but uh, most of them were, were you know, within the range of small birds that we see today and uh, they were probably pretty good flyers um, so they were basically doing a lot of the things that uh, modern birds today would be doing even though they are a completely extinct group. Now they did differ in some ways from modern birds uh, for example the majority of uh, Enantiornithes uh, had teeth uh, much like uh, most other types of dinosaurs uh, whereas of course modern birds do not However, uh, last year, a new species uh, called Euornis was discovered um, from the late Cretaceous of China. And uh, you can see the original fossil here. And something really remarkable about this specimen is that it preserves a very complete skull in three dimensions, essentially. Um, usually when we get um, pretty complete um, fossils of bird-like dinosaurs or proper birds, uh, these fossils are squished flat. Um, and so oftentimes you can't see a lot, of, a lot of the anatomical details, but in this particular specimen, you can, uh, because the bones are all still preserved in three dimensions. And uh, not only is it one of the best preserved skulls of any kind of uh, bird-like dinosaur, um, it also shows that this part particular species didn't have any teeth at all. So it kind of convergently with modern birds, uh, it had evolved a toothless beak. Um, it is not the first member of Enantiornithes uh, that we know of to be discovered with this trait, but uh, it is one of the few, and uh, certainly the quality of the specimen is really uh, astonishing. So I think this is uh, one of the most in um, interesting and potentially important um, finds in the world of Manoraptor and paleontology last year. Yeah, I agree. It's a very lovely fossil. Um, always good when you get those when you get those three dimensions yes. in place. Mm -hmm. So for our next story here, um, yeah, so invertebrate paleontology is a fascinating field mm -hmm. because it's often there where living animal groups often get more stardom than they would among zoologists and animal lovers focused on the present day. For example, bryozoans or ectoprochs. These are coral-like animals that are composed of little tentacled creatures that form colonies along stones, plants, and other animals filtering tiny food from the water. You've probably never noticed them before while going swimming, um, and they're not likely to get a lot of pages in an animal encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're interested in paleontology, 
you'll find that we have an extensive fossil record for them, going back some 485 million years ago to the Ordovician period. So what's been a major mystery is, you know, what the earliest bryozoans were like. And while genetic studies have been able to tell us that they belong in a larger clade of animals, like brachiopods, mollusks, and annelid worms, we don't have fossils from the key period of the Cambrian explosion, which is odd because most of the other major animal groups are represented by fossils from that time. There was a genus uh, called uh, Pilwakia that was unearthed from late Cretaceous, excuse me, from uh, late Cambrian rocks and described in 2010, which seemed to fit the bill. But that fossil is still very controversial and it may actually be a type of coral instead. So here we enter proto Molisian gatehousei from the early Cambrian of Australia and southern China, as described by uh, Zhilian Zhang and colleagues. Now, these fossils are tiny. They're only 1.8 to 2.2 millimeters long and 1 to 1.5 millimeters wide. Um, they're patterned with uniform subhexagonal zooids, uh, which is the technical term for the little tentacled animal that lives inside the little pockets. Um, the overall form of proto Molisian is a big dead ringer for an early bryozoan hmm. of the sort invertebrate paleontologists have been looking for. And on the left here, the uh, morphological phylogenetic analysis does place it as a stem member of bryozoa, having branched off before the living clades did, um, who then diversified from the Ordovician period onwards by incorporating calcium from the seas into their bodies. So, yeah, if, if further analysis checks out, well, we will have closed the gap in the fossil record for bryozoans by 35 million years, and then gained further insights into how these specific animals evolved. So that's just fascinating to me. Yeah, absolutely. It's always good to kind of get to the bottom of some of these Cambrian mystery creatures, and uh, you know, if uh, if they shed light on how modern biodiversity originated, then all the better. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so our next story is another one that we have covered before on the show. Uh, that is for um, our Nature News episode of um, April 2021, um, and that is a new um, a juvenile specimen of uh, another bird-like dinosaur called Archaeorhynchus from the early Cretaceous of China. And Archaeorhynchus was uh, more closely related to uh, modern birds than things like the opposite birds were. Um, however, uh, up until we got this specimen, we hadn't really, um, you know, we didn't really have uh, many uh, young juvenile specimens of dinosaurs from this part of the family tree. And so this is potentially a very important uh, finding. And so uh, it shows us a number of things. Um, first of all, uh, it shows that uh, these particular um, dinosaurs, even though they were very similar to modern birds and closely related to modern birds, uh, grew more slowly than modern birds. Um, so it, they took several years to grow to adult size, whereas uh, modern birds, um, you know, Grow to, mod, grow to adult size in a matter of weeks uh, in many cases, and so some of the fastest growth rates among all animals. Um, but uh, these particular um, uh, bird-like dinosaurs like Archaeorhynchus uh, were still uh, relatively slow growers. Um, and also, uh, this particular specimen also preserves uh, feathers. Uh, you can see that the wing feathers on this specimen are quite large, and that suggests that even though they took a longer time than modern birds to grow to adult size, uh, they could probably um, uh, achieve flight uh, earlier in their growth than most modern birds. And so uh, this has also been hypothesized for things such as the opposite birds as well. And so this suggests that uh, Archaeorhynchus, similar to the opposite birds, uh, grew more slowly than modern birds, but uh, was able to attain flight at a very early age, which is a, quite a big contrast from what we're used to when it comes to uh, bird uh, growth. Um, so that is potentially quite an important find, and that is why I chose to talk about it both here and in our news episode back uh, for April uh, of last year. So, uh, yeah. No, I definitely agree. Um, it's always good to get further insights into these near birds, kind of mm. sort of birds. Right. Um, yeah. th this is another really neat paper, and I love the the 
Haley Art reconstruction here as well. Yeah, it's really nice one. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it is based on uh, other specimens that, we, that are older individuals that are closer to adulthood or actual adults. So uh, that's a nice, really nice comparison. <laughs> yeah, so for our next paper here, um, this is a bit of a milestone for zoology mm -hmm. uh, in terms of increasing representation for minority groups. Um, we have the publication of a brand new species group of ants. Uh, that has been named uh, Strumogenes ayersthae, which inhabits the rainforests of the Choco region of Ecuador. Now, what's remarkable about this ant is not its biology, uh, being slow-moving insects that live in littered soil and sport trap jaws for catching prey, um, but it's its name that's important. Hmm. So this is the very first organism on planet Earth to sport a non-binary suffix to its species name, being the pronoun they. Hmm. So this was the natural progression of a 2007 publication, which clarified that the International Code of Nomenclature, or ICZN, you know, the, the people who are in charge of, of naming organisms, uh, was not required to have gendered suffixes match the individuals for which a species is named. Uh, in the case of this ant, uh, the man being honored, Charles Jeremy Ayers, did not identify as non-binary. But there is nonetheless a strong connection between this man and the non-binary suffix, because Jeremy Ayers had a mountain of a resume in regards to human rights work. Uh, he was a friend of the two authors, and uh, Jeremy, who unfortunately passed away in 2016 of a seizure, was, and I'm going to quote from the paper here, a multifaceted and beloved Athens-based, uh, Athens being Georgia in the United States, uh, artist and activist whose humanity and achievements defied the limits of categorized classification. Jeremy brought an intellectual and playful pan-like curiosity to every aspect of his life. He was a writer, philosopher, painter, musician, activist, photographer, gardener, and explorer of boundaries who transformed the culture that surrounded him. His deep appreciation of the variety and minute details of the natural world astounded all who knew him. And so I, I think what better way to honor his legacy than to give his name to a newly recognized fabric in the tapestry of life on mm. Earth, which also is the founding member of what will hopefully be a larger appreciation for non-binary individuals in the sciences and beyond. So I really liked this paper. What about you? Yeah, that is such an interesting decision. Um, so I, I have um, heard some some feedback uh, about uh, this this paper. Basically, people saying that um, aesthetically, maybe it would have made more sense to try and try and find a gender neutral um, suffix um, in the classical uh, languages like like Latin uh, instead of the English word "lay," which some people consider kind of awkward. But um, you know, I, I see the point there. But um, I do think it is a very good and very important that people are thinking of ways to be more inclusive in naming um, in naming organisms. And uh, this is a really great step forward, I think. Mm, absolutely. Uh, all right. So um, our next story, um, now we're getting into like actual crown birds now. Um, and this is a story that we talked about um, in my uh, update special for last year for Dinosaurs, the second chapter, basically um, talking about new discoveries that came out after um, the uh, the series was complete, or at least the particular um, relevant episode um, that they would have gone in or was complete. Um, and so you might recognize this particular image, actually, because I used it as the title slide for that episode. So this is such a big discovery, I think, um, at least in the world of bird paleontology. Um, and basically what um, this uh, study was about was that they described some new specimens of these extinct birds from uh, Central Asia um, called... Um, they, they belong to groups called Eogruids and Ergulornithids. And um, up until this paper came out, basically, in Basically, in recent times, uh, it was long. Um, it was long the general consensus that eogruids and ergulornithids were close relatives of cranes. Um, however, uh, these new specimens that were described, including part of a skull, which is labeled letter A here on the left, um, showed that it's very likely that these birds were instead uh, more closely related to ostriches of all things. Uh, so they are, were stem ostriches that. That is to say that their closest living relatives are ostriches um, and not the cranes, as uh, previously supposed. Um, 
And so this is a this is a really big discovery for a number of reasons. So first of all, is that there had been some previous people who had already suspected that eogruids and ergulonithids were stem ostriches, but uh, you know that uh, kind of fell by the wayside as other people pointed out that they seem to have other uh, features, mostly of their hind limbs, which are most of what we have of the remains um, seem to resemble cranes more. But with these new specimens, they kind of swung the pendulum far back in, um, in, the, um, uh, in the ostrich direction. The skull has some pretty clear ostrich-like features. Um, and furthermore, um, the hind limbs um, actually do have features that are uh, similar to both um, modern ostriches as well as other extinct ostrich-like birds. And so it now seems much more likely that these were a big group of um, stem ostriches that used to roam uh, Central Asia. And they, they've also been found in Europe as well. Um, so uh, on the slide here in the middle is a comparison to the back half of an ostrich skull, which is labeled C, and the back half of a, a limpkin, which is a relative of cranes, um, in the, labeled by the letter D. Um, and so, yeah, this is a really significant discovery that we finally understand what these birds actually are probably um, and furthermore it also shows that ostriches um, have had a long and very diverse um, history in the northern hemisphere um, which is uh, if you know anything about ostriches and ostrich like birds you know that it's quite relevant to what we think we know about how and where they evolved um, so yeah uh, I'm really glad this paper finally came out, and uh, it, it is really exciting to, to see this uh, such, a, such a dramatic revision in our understanding of these birds. And I will also mention that this skull, this specimen, had actually been mentioned in a paper from the 1980s, but we just never had a photograph of it or a proper description of it, and so we finally got, got to see what it actually looks like, and it turns out, oh, it supports the ostrich hypothesis. So, uh, yeah, really fantastic. Um, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I think that's amazing. And I, I didn't know that that last detail. That's actually really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, like studies like this, I mean, are just amazing to me. I mean, it, it would be like if we had a study that found that saber-toothed cats were actually members of Afrotheria. Or right, like yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's completely unexpected, but mm -hmm. really exciting nonetheless. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, speaking of classification news uh, that's sort of like where our next story comes in right yeah um for the longest time it was common knowledge that the vast majority of animal life uh, under the clade bilateria that is being bilater uh, bilaterally symmetrical at least ancestrally uh, fell into two major groups the protostomes uh, which includes arthropods mollusks annelid worms nematodes and the like and deuterostomes, which are echinoderms and acorn worms, and the vertebrates. So the former, during their embryonic development, has their blastopore, which opens to the digestive tract, uh, emerge as the mouth first, after which the anus opens. And the latter has that completely opposite. The anus opens first, and then the mouth, uh, which has led to many a sarcastic joke about how we all start life as assholes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, many studies throughout the 20th and 21st century, both morphological and molecular, have come in support of this arrangement, but recent studies have begun to call this long-held fact into question. And here, uh, Paschalia Copley and colleagues tackle the problem. The issue mainly boils down to issues with the phylogenetic studies themselves, which have tended to produce short branches with low support, meaning that the likelihood of all supposed deuterostomes belonging to the same lineage is not very high. Uh, they recovered only a handful of genes that could support a monophyletic deuterostomia, but more so than the amount of genes that support their non-monophyly, and are often rife with errors, uh, which would give the illusion of monophyly for deuterostomes had those errors not been fixed. So it seems that the animals that have been grouped together into this clay deuterostomia uh, evolved very rapidly during the early years of animal life on Earth, perhaps at an unequal rate compared with other animal lineages. And so all taken together, there is far more support for protostomes being a clade than for deuterostomes, which may now be considered two distinct clades. Uh, in this case, one would be for the chordates, of which the vertebrates are a part, 
and the other for echinoderms and acorn worms, which are called ambulacrarians. Uh, the implications here are important because it may mean that certain anatomical and genetic traits once thought distinct in t to deuterostomes, like the genes for pharyngeal gill slits as one example, these actually may have been present in the common ancestor of all bilaterian animals. And this could also mean that certain fossil animals, like the mysterious Vetulacolians of the mid-Cambrian period, which are pictured here to the left, well, they may not be related to chordates after all, as had been previously argued, but may instead be early proterostomes, so more closely related to insects and clams than to the fishes that they resemble. Mm. So just how these two groups relate to the proterostomes, well, that's going to be an issue for another day. But the authors at least propose two names for whatever scheme ends up being used. Um, so if chordates and protostomes end up being close relatives, then we'd use centroneuralia. If the ambulacrarians, that's the echinoderm group, uh, and the protostomes end up as close relatives instead, then we'd use orthozoa. So, yeah, like this this was a really neat paper. It really reminds me of the whole ornithoskeleta mess mm, regarding right. the the early origins of dinosaurs mm -hmm. um so at the moment yeah we have just a big polytomy between traditional deuterostomes and protostomes and mm -hmm. so it's an open question about what the ancestors of the bilaterians was actually like so that's it's kind of neat for you know being a wrench in a you know centuries long consensus isn't mm -hmm. it yeah, this was a fascinating paper. It is one of those, like, oh, everything we thought we knew was wrong moments. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I'm really f interested to see where this develops. And uh, I, I will say that I, I don't expect this to be the last word on the subject by any means. Uh, uh, this definitely isn't oh, a, yeah. an open and shut case. Um, but uh, yes, I, I am, you know, waiting with bated breath to, to see well, how, how this develops. Uh, it, it is super interesting, and uh, def certainly the implications for these fossil groups as well um, are uh, worth looking forward to. I think there will be a lot of, there will be a lot of interesting stories coming out of this um, in the coming years, for sure. <laughs> All right, um, so um, for my next story uh, is a story about a recently extinct bird called Nisotrochus. Actually, it's several uh, different species under the genus Nisotrochus. Um, the Nisotrochus is um, a gruiform, so it is a close relative of cranes, but uh, it's even more closely related to the rails. Um, and it is a flightless bird, uh, or several species of flightless birds that were until recently found on um, the islands, some of the islands in the Caribbean. And so uh, there are many different types of island-dwelling uh, rails um, that have become flightless, and so traditionally it has been assumed that, oh well, yeah, well, Nisotrochus was just another one of those uh, flightless island rails. Um, however, a new study managed to extract um, ancient DNA from these uh, recently extinct uh, birds, uh, since the remains are still you know, relatively young. Um, and they found that uh, it turns out the Nisotrochus was not a true rail, uh, but instead more closely related to a different group of rail-like birds called the fluff tails. Um, and fluff tails today are found in Africa, including Madagascar, and also in New Guinea. Um, and in fact, it was only in relatively recent times that we recognized them as a separate group from the rails, uh, because they are so rail-like in terms of their overall appearance and anatomy. Um, however, uh, genetic studies have since shown that the, they are actually a distinct group, even though they are still pretty closely related to rails. And it turns out that Nisotrochus was actually a, a close relative in turn to the fluff tails. And so that kind of expands the range of this lineage of birds uh, to uh, not just uh, you know, Africa and New Guinea, but also the Caribbean islands. And something else um, that uh, is shown on the map here is that you'll notice in New Zealand, there's also a silhouette there. And that's because there is this other group of recently extinct birds that actually grew quite large um, called the AIDS bills. Uh, so they were a group of um, uh, seemingly carnivorous um, gruiforms, uh, so probably eating a lot of smaller animals um, on New Zealand back when they were alive. Um, and it turns out that there have been also been um, uh, recent uh, ancient DNA studies that have put 
the AIDS bills as close relatives of the fluff tails too. And so we went from uh, not realizing that this lineage of birds actually you know, even existed to finding that they are actually sort of all over the place, uh, at least until recently. Um, and so uh, this is a really fascinating um, piece of work that you know puts into context a rather mysterious uh, um, genus of birds. And uh, I also talked about this story in more detail in the update special for Dinosaurs, the second chapter. So you can go there to uh, hear more about that. Yeah, this is a really neat paper. Um, gosh, rails are just a wonderful group of birds in mm -hmm. general. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, so for our next paper here, um, so this is kind of funny. There were two fish stories last year where I couldn't really decide which one to pick, so I just kind of chose to cover both of them here. Mm -hmm. So um, the first is by Ariel L. Camp. That's kind of ironic. Uh, and it focuces on the vertebrae of ray fin fish. Now, you might think that a neck on a fish is something that just doesn't exist, mm -hmm. you know what? allowing the animal to rotate its head in three dimensions. Um, but it wasn't clear whether certain fish could actually do this anyway or not, you know, neck or no neck. Um, so Camp examined two species, the rainbow trout and the Commerson's frogfish, and took x-ray videos of the fish feeding in a tank. They were then humanely euthanized and had their bones modeled into polygonal mesh. So these parts could then be further modeled and measured found was that these two species could indeed rotate their head in a very neck-like motion through the extension of their dorsoventral vertebrae. And the range of motion shown is in the image on the right. Um, and you know what? Not through any great stress on their part, um, just through normal feeding. Hmm. Uh, in the case of the frog mouth, in fact, uh, the spine was even moving in an S-curve. Now, of course, these types of movements are facilitated by the entire vertebral column, but they do offer clues to these sorts of anatomical conditions that allowed the first tetrapods, which are technically fish, to evolve necks in the first place. That's kind of neat. Um, and then the second fish study is by Yinian Mu and colleagues. So here we have the whole genome sequencing of a truly remarkable species. This is the Yapadal snailfish, which is currently unnamed scientifically. Hmm. So the hadal zone is a term in oceanography for depths exceeding 6,000 meters, or over 19,600 feet, meaning that the pressure is intense, the temperature is cold, and the visibility, and all this, at least in terms of you know, human understanding, is impossible. Um, but the snailfish is able to do just fine hmm. because it lives 7,000 meters deep in the Yap Trench in the Western Pacific Ocean without much care in the world. So, you know, while it's not the deepest living fish known, you know, that honor goes to the Puerto Rican cusk eel, Abyssobotrila galatii, which was found at 8,370 meters deep. <laughs> Salute! Mm. Um, any information we can glean from species like this can help us understand just how they do it. Uh, I mean, they're so well adapted, in fact, that, as you can see in the photos on the left, you, you take it out of the water, it looks like an uncooked chicken breast. <laughs> <laughs> which is you know normal for deep sea fish like this mm -hmm. yeah um so what did they find well uh, the yap hadal snailfish is able to protect its dna from high hydrostatic pressure by sporting special proteins like rad9a that are constantly making repairs to the dna and they also have a recombinase called rad51 that seeks out DNA bases for use in repairs, so it actively speeds up the process of DNA repair. Now, of course, protein function can also be hampered by such high underwater pressures, so the snailfish has also found to have a really good protein stabilizer called TMAO that keeps things in check. And what's especially neat is that the synthesization of TMAO is maintained by special gut bacteria that provide the necessary ingredients to make it. So it seems that it takes a lot of adaptations to allow an animal like the yap hadal snailfish to even survive so far below the surface. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not just a matter of parts of the body that we can see, but it's also at the molecular level itself. So lots of exciting news about fish that we can 
talk about from 2021. What do you think, Albert? Yep, absolutely. Both of both of these are really interesting um, stories. Um, yeah, I remember seeing the one about the fish with the with quote unquote uh, necks, basically. Uh, yeah, I, that that was so fascinating because of course birds, um, not birds, uh, fish anatomically don't don't have a neck, and yet they can sort of uh, replicate those motions anyway. It's yeah, the fish spine as a surrogate neck. That, that was definitely a really memorable study. And uh, yeah, I, I actually didn't know that the Yapadal snailfish was an undescribed species. Uh, so yeah, wow, but they already you know understand quite a bit about its genome thanks to this new study. So talk about being ahead of its uh, ahead of the curve, as it were. <laughs> well, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, all right, so let's see what our next um, story is. Okay, so uh, this is uh, another new species. Uh, this is a new fossil hawk uh, from the Oligocene of Australia called Archihyrax. And uh, this is pr- pretty notable because uh, we don't have um, a lot of good fossils of um, uh, hawks and their relatives from the early part of the Cenozoic. And so, yeah, this is a really notable find. So pictured here is a Tarsa metatarsus. Um, the uh, fused uh, foot and ankle bones um, of this new hawk. However, it is actually known from much more of the skeleton, like pretty much uh, most of the bones in the limbs are represented. There's even parts of the skull. Um, so very, very complete fossil um, for, a, for a bird and especially for a hawk-like bird. Um, it was uh, pretty big. Uh, it was uh, almost, though not quite as big as the largest uh, living raptor in um, Australia today, the wedge-tailed eagle. Um, and uh, it probably lived in a forested environment back in the Oligocene, so it was probably hunting um, pretty decently sized uh, birds and marsupials. Um, they're uh, so early relatives of possums and koalas, for example. And uh, it seemed to have relatively short wings, which are pretty common for uh, forest dwelling raptors, so they can kind of maneuver their way through the trees. And Finally, the authors actually bothered to include the, the, this species in a phylogenetic analysis, which is uh, not as common as you might like uh, when it comes to describing fossil birds. Um, and they found that uh, it seems that Archihyrax was not especially closely related to any particular living species of, um, of hawk. And so, uh, yeah, it seems to represent a sort of extinct branch that was doing its own thing. Um, so quite a significant discovery, and uh, it's always cool to see more new material coming out of Australia, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, that's really exciting. Um, Australia is definitely the land of possibilities in terms of new species. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, for our next story, um, yeah, it's kind of like my dilemma with the fish stories. I, I couldn't choose between these two mm-hmm. about extinct elephants, so I lump them together on this slide again. So the first story is by Meek Kohler and colleagues and concerns the adorably small Sicilian dwarf elephant, which lived on the islands of Sicily and Malta during the middle Pleistocene epoch and appears to have died out by the close of the Pleistocene. Uh, There were many elephant species that underwent insular dwarfism, so having your population isolated on an island and gradually becoming smaller over the generations as a means of adapting to highland resources. And these elephants, uh, technically called Paleoloxodon falconeri, uh, were the smallest of the lot. Now, the chart on this slide is an indication here on the right. Uh, males average 96 centimeters tall and females 80 centimeters tall. And then the babies were about as big as toy dogs. Um, and they only weighed a few hundred kilos. Now, it had been previously speculated that as these elephants became smaller over time, their life history shrunk too, only making it to 26 years old before passing. But this new study has put those older estimates to bed. By examining thin slices of bone, and that includes tusks and teeth, under a microscope and analyzing their growth patterns, as one might do with tree rings, the authors found that the Sicilian dwarf elephant not only took far more time to grow than was originally thought, they actually had a slower relative rate of bone growth than the larger elephants living on the mainland continents. Um, So our new life expectancy for the Sicilian dwarf elephant was found to be over 68 years, and that means reaching sexual maturity about 15 years later than African or Asian elephants do, and having a longer gestation period as well. Now, it is speculated that having lived on an island with no predators to hunt them or their infants, 
these elephants could afford to take their time growing, hmm. which is in sharp contrast to our original understanding of island dwarfism in elephants, in which the trend is to evolve a quicker life history. Uh, this kind of reminded me of giant tortoises a little bit, um, but it should be noted that this type of growth is also very human-like as well. So our other study is by Yu Chen Wang and colleagues, and is not technically an elephant study, but it does feature them heavily. So the main focus here is instead on the wider Arctic region during the later half of the Quaternary period, and how the environment changed over time as the cycles of the Ice Age proceeded. This was mainly done through the study of environmental DNA across large swaths of northern North America, Greenland, Scandinavia, and Siberia. Now, as might be expected, the overall composition of the plant life in this region fluctuated as the climate shifted from interglacial to glacial conditions, with the herbaceous steppe tundra flora having a consistent turnover rate until 38,000 years ago, after which the diversity of plant species reached a high peak during the last glacial maximum. Now, of course, as the climate warmed following the LGM, uh, plants began to diversify in their own ways in various parts of the Arctic and the steppe tundra began to decline as woody plants increased in abundance. Uh, in northern Siberia, the steppe tundra actually managed to survive at a relatively decent size, which meant that the animals adapted to living in such an environment could survive for far longer too. And here's where things become relevant to elephants. This eDNA study also studied traces of animal life throughout this time, and it found that some of the familiar Ice Age megafauna had outpaced the extinction of their neighbors in other parts of the world. Uh, specifically for our purposes here, the woolly mammoth was found to have remained in continental America until around 8,600 years ago, in northeast Siberia until 7,300 years ago, and in north central Siberia until 3,900 years ago. Now recall that We've already known about the survival of dwarf woolly mammoths on Wrangell Island in Siberia until 3,600 years ago. And then, of course, there's the mammoths on St. Paul Island in Alaska until 5,600 years ago. But still, this is well within the Holocene Epoch mm -hmm. and well within the history of Homo sapiens in Siberia, which had led the authors to the controversial conclusion that human hunting was not the cause of their extinction. Which is difficult to confirm for sure, because the researchers who have studied the megafaunal extinctions have argued, and I think fairly convincingly, that human pressures on megafauna need not be so blatant as to cause extinction. Mm -hmm. You can hunt only a few mammoths every generation or so, and that would be enough to tip the scales against the favor. You know, we're not talking about a Blitzkrieg like the original Blitzkrieg model by Paul Martin. Um, but admittedly, I'm less drawn to the implications of extinction than I am of the implications of human coexistence with mammoths mm -hmm. so late into the Holocene. Uh, I mean, if the timing is correct, that means woolly mammoths were around for all the great demographic transitions that led to the overall population replacements of the ancient North Eurasians and the Paleo-Siberians and the Neo-Siberians, as discussed in my lecture series. And, yeah, I mean, just imagine what these peoples may have thought about seeing animals like these. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, two fascinating studies that kind of open up the world of elephants a little bit, which uh, I thought were pretty important to share. Yeah, absolutely. Both of these were extremely interesting. And, yeah, it's always great to, to learn more about these uh these lost elephants, as it were. <laughs> All right, so uh, my next uh, story is about um, the origins of being able to taste sweet things in songbirds, which is a pretty interesting topic. Um, so I suppose uh, this is probably not something that we normally think about, but uh, most uh, birds that aren't songbirds um, seemingly cannot taste sweetness. Uh, yeah, so uh, possibly this relates to the fact that uh, since uh, birds evolved from carnivorous dinosaurs that they lost the ability to taste sweetness during their um, early evolution. Um, because carnivores, you know, don't eat a lot of sweet things, so they don't really need to be able to have that sense. However, uh, we do know that later on a lot of birds did evolve to feed on sweet 
foods, such as fruits and nectar, and many of these birds are songbirds. And so a new study uh, looked at the taste receptors, um, you know, taste receptors on the tongue, of um, many different types of songbirds and their close relatives, and they found that a sweet taste perception, the ability to taste sweet things, is very common among songbirds. And so what is being shown on the image here um, is that uh, whether or not the um, taste receptors of uh, these birds respond to amino acids, uh, which are found in proteins and aren't sweet, or sugars. And you can see here in the top row with the uh, kind of purple and blue and green lines are showing whether um, taste receptors are responding to amino acids. And so if uh, basically if you see the, uh, the lines going up, that means that the taste receptors are responding to increased concentrations of these molecules. Um, whereas if they kind of stay flat, that means they aren't responding to those molecules. And so on this um, figure here, uh, most of the birds uh, towards the right are all songbirds. Um, so the only two birds that aren't songbirds on this figure are the two on the left. Uh, these are subalcine uh, birds, which are close relatives of songbirds, but not songbirds proper. And you can see that the two subalcines, uh, their taste receptors do respond to amino acids, but not to sugars. The sugars are the orange and red lines um, on the bottom. And whereas in pretty much all the songbirds that are being shown on this uh, figure, uh, all of them are able to taste sweet things, even though they have a variety of different diets. So some of them do eat nectar, for example, but there are others that eat primarily insects, and others that eat seeds, and others that eat a little bit of everything, uh, but all of them are able to taste sweetness. And so it seems that uh, the ability to taste sweetness was something that originated very early in the evolution of songbirds, such that nearly all of them um, have this ability, and uh, it is interesting to ponder uh, how this might have influenced their evolution. Um, if you want to know more about that, uh, you should check out the episode on uh, Passeriform birds, a group that includes songbirds, and dinosaurs, the second chapter. That is the final episode, episode 15. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we go into a bit more detail about what uh, being able to taste sweet things might mean for them. And actually, we talk a little bit about that in the episode on parrots as well, which is the previous um, episode, episode 14. So yeah, you should uh, check those out if you want to learn more about uh birds and their relationship to sugar. <laughs> That's kind of a, an interesting perspective, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, as humans, we're so used to all of our all of our different tastes. And right. So it's kind of hard to imagine not having one of those, like not being able to taste sweets. You know, not I can't imagine not enjoying a cookie or a piece of candy. Yeah, you know? <laughs> indeed. <laughs> but that's really neat. Um, all right, so our next uh, story here, um, <laughs> yeah, it seems the White Sands National Park in New Mexico <laughs> is becoming a regular guest on Through Time and Clay. It really is, yeah. <laughs> it's like, in, it's, it's, yeah, it's an important site in archaeology and paleontology right now, and it's, it's kind of fun to follow its progress over the, over the months. Um, yeah, so if you all remember, during our February 2021 news episode, uh, where we covered a paper on the environmental history of the Greater Tularosa Basin, which includes the White Sands National Park, and how that sloth hunting party may have actually been an artifact of stratigraphy. Mention that the authors of that particular study were open to the possibility that there was a hunt after all. But the catch would be that dated between 35,000 and 25,700 years ago, it would be evidence of humans in North America far earlier than archaeologists have thought, or have tended to think. Um, well, that possibility has become at least far more likely, thanks to this paper by Matthew Bennett and colleagues. Um, pictured here on this slide are a series of very clear footprints belonging to children, teens, and a few adults that have been radiocarbon dated, thanks to these little tiny ditch grass seeds that have been embedded underfoot to between 23 and 21,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum. So that makes these prints the oldest known evidence of actual human bodies in the greater parts of the Americas. So I'm not talking about stone tools or use of fire or potential shelters. Um, and it does predate the genetic evidence for the earliest ancestry of Amerindian ancestors on the continent, which is around 17,500 years ago. 
And you know what? A lot of r rigorous work was done on these prints to ensure that the analysis was valid. Um, not everyone is convinced. And in fact, right before the time of recording, there was a brief exchange. Um, so there was a comment by David B. Madison and colleagues that was arguing that the radiocarbon dating of the grass seeds that were used in the study may not be accurate as you know those plants use dissolved inorganic carbon for photosynthesis which can skew dating methods by thousands of years and they figured that the authors may not have been aware of this well the authors have responded and yeah they were totally aware of that and they checked for this error and were able to reaffirm the validity of their methods and dates um so that was, that, it's a neat exchange and of course all these links we'll have on our description so you can follow along with that mm -hmm. but nonetheless you know th this discovery has become incorporated into a wider ongoing discourse about the peopling and early history of the americas of course a very key publication last year by the crema tea archaeologist paulette steves that is pictured here on the right will i hope add further enlightenment onto these discussions so this of course being the indigenous paleolithic of the western hemisphere I've had the great fortune to read sections of the book and have already learned so much. Mm. I mean, there really are a number of sites in both North and South America that reveal some very impressive dates and have all undergone the sort of intense study required for archaeological sites. Uh, for example, there are sites in southern Mexico like Huayal Taco and in California like Calico that apparently span back over 200,000 years. Um, these haven't really been touched since the 1980s, and they would really benefit from re-examination. Um, and in a bit of an update to Humanity, a prologue, uh, I now have a much greater appreciation for the Ceruti site in California, which you may recall is of a mastodon carcass that was found with hammer stones and cut marks, but was dated to 130,000 years ago. Well, I had initially sided with the story that prior construction work on the site was to blame for that mix-up. So it, it created artificial stones and cuts that resembled early human work, basically meaning that the whole site was bupkis. Um, but after reading Steve's account, uh, I found myself mistaken. Uh, so the three authors behind that particular paper, well, they knew after the initial dates had come in that they had to really check and double check and then triple check again to make sure that there were no errors in their analysis and even after publication you know they made sure to address every critique presented to them by other archaeologists so basically what the sitch is those mastodon bones had been preserved in a thick layer of pedogenic carbonate long before the site was dug up and those had over those had overlaid on the cut marks which means that those cut marks were not the cause of construction equipment. And so, yeah, humans in the North America 130,000 years ago, it pretty much checks out for the most part. Um, so with that in mind, you know, what does this mean for the story of the early Americas? You know, uh, how many times did Homo sapiens enter the hemisphere? Were they all from northeastern Siberia? Were some of them actually other species of hominins, things like Denisovans or Neanderthals? Um, I mean, remains of those two are being found further and further east in Eurasia, and there was an extensive period of hominin occupation in northern Asia for the greater part of a million years or so. Um, and you know what? Speculation about their boating abilities is slowly rising. So, you know, how did these people, you know, arrive on the continents and live there? There's a lot more that can be said, and this is not the last word on the subject by any means. Um, in fact, uh, with the publishing of Jennifer Raff's Origin, A Genetic History of the Americas, in February of this year, and also with the second edition of David J. Meltzer's First Peoples in a New World, having been just published last month, well, there's going to be plenty of reading available for enthusiasts of Native America. So... Yeah, it's a contentious study, but it's a fascinating one nonetheless, and uh, I, I had to mention it here. Yeah, definitely. This is uh, such an intriguing subject, and uh, I certainly look forward to hearing about news on this front, too. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so uh, my next story is also about songbirds, as a matter of fact, but uh, it is about a particular group of songbirds called the dippers, and these are the only semi-aquatic group of songbirds. So they live near rivers and streams, and they'll actually swim underwater to catch uh, aquatic insects and small fish. Um, and so they do this uh, by kind of flapping their wings underwater as though they were flying. So they are wing-propelled divers, um, so similar to penguins and ox, but of course at a much smaller scale and uh, being in the uh, freshwater habitat instead of the ocean. Um, however, uh, there is a sort of an interesting question that's been brought up now and then, and that is, would be we be able to recognize dippers as wing-propelled divers based on their anatomy? Um, because if you look at the photo here, for example, you look at them and think, well, that's a pretty normal looking songbird. So could, would, we, would we be able to tell that they had this unusual ecology? And so there was this really detailed paper that came out last year uh, looking at many different aspects of dipper anatomy and comparing them to other wing propelled diving birds. Um, yeah, so they looked at uh, dipper skeletons, um, they looked at their feathers, they looked at uh, their uh, other soft tissues like their muscles, uh, their brain structure, uh, their behavior, and uh, just put all these things together and compared them to other wing-propelled diving birds to see if they had the characteristic wing-propelled diving features. And the answer is, uh, they actually do, but up to a point. Um, and so, for example, uh, over here um, is showing the uh, breast bones on the, on the right of several different types of birds. Um, so on the top is a dipper's breast bone, um, and uh, the bottom two are other types of wing-propelled diving birds. And uh, the one labeled letter B, um, so the second one from the top, is a non-wing-propelled diving bird. I think it's supposed to be a gull. Um, and so what it's showing is that uh, in typical wing-propelled diving birds, the sternum tends to be narrower than they would be in other types of birds. And you can see that in the dipper sternum, or breastbone, uh, the sternum is a little bit narrower um, than normal, but it is not super narrow. Uh, it's not as narrowed as you see in the uh, other types of birds that are pictured here. And so, uh, yeah, so dippers do exhibit a number of adaptations that are related to wing propelled diving and that we can identify uh, from their skeletons and other parts of their uh, body as well, uh, but uh, oftentimes to a lesser extent than seen in, uh, say, penguins and hawks. Um, and so that is quite interesting. And they did also report that uh, most of the adaptations uh, that are related to wing propelled diving in dippers seem to be found in the soft tissue and not as much in the skeleton. Um, and so it is uh, somewhat true that it might be difficult for us to figure out that they were wing propelled divers based on the skeleton, although not impossible. Um, and the authors hypothesize that maybe dippers um, do not have as extreme wing-propelled diving adaptations compared to other wing-propelled diving birds, uh, perhaps because they are a much younger group um, than those other groups. Um, and uh, so they originated later and haven't been doing this wing-propelled diving for as long a period of time. Um, and so maybe that's why they haven't, uh, you know, had really had the chance to evolve uh, a lot of these adaptations yet. And that's certainly a possibility. Um, although uh, in I, I, I talked uh, with um, Katrina Van Grau about this, and uh, she also has suggested that maybe it is simply a matter of habitat, because after all, uh, the rivers and streams that dippers are diving in uh, are, are a lot shallower than the oceans that uh, penguins and ox are swimming in. And so it may be that dippers just haven't needed to become as extreme divers as those other birds do. Um, and so in any case, uh, I do think it is really great that people actually finally uh, decide to take a very detailed look at this question. And it is always good to see a new um, uh, studies on the anatomy of songbirds, which uh, are very understudied in that respect. <laughs> That's really fascinating. It, it just kind of goes to show that there's often more to a critter than meets the eye. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> That's, that's really fascinating. I love comparative studies like this. Um, so, all right. Um, my last of the 2021 roundup stories. Um, this is like one of mine that's been covered before. Um, but I think that they were real headliners this year as far as anthropology is concerned. Um, real headliners last year as far as anthropology is concerned. Um, 
The first, of course, is the Harbin Skull from Northeast China. It has been named Homo Longi, or Dragon Human, by uh, Changji and colleagues. Uh, we've already talked at length about this rediscovery during our Humanity of Prologue update special. But in brief, after remaining hidden in a well for 85 years, the skull was brought to the attention of archaeologists and given a thorough examination that led to the publication of three simultaneous papers. The authors ran a morphological phylogenetic analysis on the 146,000-year-old skull, comparing it to all sorts of hominins from across the Pleistocene, and concluded that, while it seems closely related to Denisovans, this hominin was distinct enough to possibly represent a second East Asian lineage, whom they call Homo longi. And this has led to all sorts of comments, ranging from excitement to frustration, <laughs> uh, particularly over certain aspects of the analyses, including the suggestion that the Denisovan slash Homo longi lineage was actually more closely related to our species than to Neanderthals, um, as they had went with a study on just morphology alone that was apparently more parsimonious than the one that incorporated both fossils and ancient DNA. Um, as well as the idea that this may just be, you know, the complete skull of the Denisovan that we had been looking for for over a decade. Um, but at the moment, there hasn't really been much news about Homo longi since its publication, uh, nor any new studies on the skull, like attempts to extract DNA from it. Um, I know that there have been some recent papers that have been going along with the hypothesis that there may be two types of hominin living in East Asia, you know, Denisovans and whatever Homo longi's lineage is. But those are just speculations, really. Mm. Um, nevertheless, I mean, the skull is very lovely, and it adds another piece to the muddle in the middle regarding the Eurasian Paleolithic. Um, the same can't be said about the skull and jaw material that was found at Neshiramla in Israel. Uh, described by Israel Hertzkevich and colleagues, uh, the remains here, uh, and they're shown in a reconstruction on the right, uh, these were dated to between 140 and 120,000 years ago, and they seem to have belonged to a previously unknown population of hominins that must have coexisted with early Homo sapiens and Neanderthals in the Levant, as we have fossils of both from sites there. Uh, level lost stone tools of a style that is near identical to Levantine Homo sapiens, uh, and evidence of fire use and hunting were also found among the Nesharamla hominins, uh, of which the morphological analysis suggested were related to the last common ancestor of Neanderthals and Denisovans. Uh, so this is not necessarily a new species of hominin. And there was also talk about possible cultural interactions between these different hominins, which would add to the complexity of the region's history. Now, since we covered that paper in our update special, there have been some back and forth discussions about these remains. Hmm. Uh, researchers Yol Rock and Asaf Marum have made a comment that the anatomy of the Nesharamla mandible pointed to a classification as just a Neanderthal, to which the original authors then argued at length that their interpretation was wrong. <laughs> so it turns out that they had pointed to the existence of a paleodeme in the Levant, which basically means an interbreeding population at the lowest level of size. Um, and the Nesharamla skull material has been argued to relate to other remains that have been found there, like the Galilei skull of Mugret el Zutea cave and uh, the Tabun Cave 1 skull. But those have been known about for years, and it seems that Nesharamla falls within the variation seen in this paleodeme. Um, however, the authors do remain respectfully open to further research and interpretation. So... At this point, the case remains open. You know, maybe ne the Nesharamla remains are from Neanderthals, or maybe they actually do belong to this Paleodeme, which, I mean, is close to Neanderthals as you can get. I mean, considering this is, according to the um, uh, morphological work done on the various hominin remains in the region, this would be a group that's basal to Neanderthals and Denisovans, so they would have emerged before those groups uh, arose and split into their respective lineages. So, yeah, the the Paleolithic is becoming ever more complex case, uh, ever more complex place, as 
we're finding more and more fossils, and it seems like our ancestors shared the world with a whole host of hominins that would make any Lord of the Rings fan excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it it is very cool to, to see these uh, <laughs> the, these new these new fossils, and you know, regardless of what they turn out to be in the end, I'm sure they are all uh, very valuable for uh, contributing to our understanding of human uh, evolution and origins. Mm. All right, so uh, I think the next story is our final kind of roundup story. Um, and so this is a story about another new species, but this time it's a living species. And so this is a new species of a songbird that was discovered, or rather described, uh, last year. And so birds in general are uh, a very well-documented group of animals in modern day. There are a lot of people out there uh, looking at birds, and uh, they are relatively easy to observe for most part, especially compared to some other types of animals. Um, and so we have a pretty good understanding of what birds are out there. And uh, we have probably discovered almost all the birds there are out there to discover in the modern day. Um, However, uh, there are still new species of birds being named. Um, and the majority of these discoveries are uh, so-called uh, cryptic species. So uh, basically species we didn't previously recognize as their own species, but were perhaps lumped into uh, close relatives. Um, and further work um, leads certain researchers to um, suggest that they should be recognized as distinct species. However, uh, there are also still bird species being described that are honest to goodness uh, new species that had not been previously um, you know, named by, at least by Western scientists. Um, and so this is an example of one of these actual new species that uh, had not received a scientific name yet. Uh, and this is a tanager um, that has been um, uh, a common name, the suggested common name uh, by the authors is the Inti Tanager, after an, an indigenous word, word for the sun, uh, thanks to its bright yellow plumage. And the Inti Tanager um, is actually a very distinctive bird. Uh, you can see that the male, uh, as pictured in the photo here, is bright yellow. Um, you can also see in the illustration to the, uh, to the right there that the males have a little crest on top of the head and a dark stripe that kind of runs uh, just above and over the eye. Um, and furthermore, the female is not quite as brightly colored, but it's still a pretty bright yellow as well. Um, and so these are very distinctive uh, species of bird that uh, cannot really be confused for anything else within their habitat. Um, and so this is definitely one of the most uh, you know, eye-catching new species of birds that have been named, uh, modern birds at least, in, in recent years. Um, now, the reason it took so long for this uh, species to be named, uh, in part, is because it's actually very secretive. You'd think that a bright yellow bird like this would be really easy to spot, but actually they spend a lot of time hidden in dense bamboo thickets and uh, other types of foliage. So uh, they are actually very difficult to observe, and it took many kind of uh, trips out there into, into the field um, for scientists to be able to collect enough information about the species to actually properly scientifically describe it. Um, as for where it was discovered, um, it lives in uh, parts of Peru and Bolivia along the Andes, and it seems to undergo seasonal migrations, that is, it moves to different parts of the Andes uh, based on the seasons, which is pretty rare for um, uh, this group of birds called the tanagers, of which are many, many um, species, literally hundreds of species um, in the tropical Americas. And so, yeah, amazing find. Uh, and one of the most distinctive uh, new species of birds to be discovered in recent years. Um, and I think it's a, it's a good discovery to end on for, for our roundup. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. And honest to goodness, like new species of bird like that, it seems most new bird discoveries are taxonomic disputes. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Trying to figure out how many like of the living birds there actually are in the world versus right. like, Oh, this is a bird that I don't usually see. It has never been described right, yeah. before. Um, it is a cutie. It is a really pretty bird. I love the kind of eyebrow thing it's got going on. Yeah, right. With the male. 
<laughs> yeah, and of course, uh, we don't know too much about how it actually lives just yet because the observations are so limited at the moment. But uh, I'm sure uh, people will be going out there to try and find it, uh, you know, and observe it, uh, you know, in the in the future. So uh, I'm sure we'll be learning more about it soon. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. Um, well, fantastic. So that is it for our 2021 roundup. Uh, segments of this episode. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed these many diverse stories from the natural world. Um, as always, this is really a handful of all the stories that were you know, published last year. Mm -hmm. We could have had a completely different arrangement and then another one and then another one after that. Absolutely. But we like these stories pretty well and so uh, we hope you all were able to learn something new and also maybe be surprised a little bit. So now we're going to jump into our December 2021 story. So this is this is more typical, of course, of, of what we do for our nature news. Mm. So we're going to spend a little bit more time on these these uh, these next five studies. And uh, we'll open up to like more discussion, of course, in the meantime. So first of all, let's jump to the next slide. Uh, I have the first story here. So. We've talked about myriapods very briefly during the entire run of Through Time and Clades. Mm -hmm. uh, we dedicated one of our 2020 roundup stories, incidentally, to a recap of our coverage for Dino Nerds for Black Lives, which was the charity event that we participated in. Um, and uh, at that point, we were focusing on the early history of the group and a particular study that suggested the youthy carcinoids were stem myriapods. So as a brief review of the crown myriapods, uh, these constitute one of the major lineages of living arthropods, and they are close relatives of crustaceans, and by extension, insects. Uh, the name is Greek for countless legs, and that's a fair descriptor because these guys tend to have lots and lots of legs. <laughs> but besides that, the group is defined by having segmented bodies with all of the parts being fairly uniform in shape, uh, in having a pair of antennae that are jointed, much like those of insects, and in most members having simple eyes that don't see very well. So they rely more on scents and on their antennae for finding things. And there are four living groups today, uh, and of course that does not include a host of fossil forms that include some of the earliest land animals, as well as some of the earliest land giants. Of course, uh, I'm referring to Arthropleura, uh, which some of the larger species could have grown as much as two and a half meters long, um, which is impressive for, for a myriapod. Mm -hmm. So we have the tiny poropods and symphylans, which are probably little known to most folks. Uh, they max out at a few millimeters in length, and they root around in the damp soil and detritus looking like uh, little gummy versions of their larger relatives, <laughs> these being the, the centipedes and the millipedes. Now, uh, those two are pretty simple to tell apart. Uh, centipedes have one pair of legs per body segment, and millipedes have two pairs. Uh, centipedes are mainly carnivorous, and they can give a nasty pinch uh, with their mandibles, while millipedes are mainly herbivorous, uh, but they won't bite uh, people. Um, but they will secrete a nasty, itchy toxin if you mess with them. Mm -hmm. So give those guys a wide berth if you can. Um, centipedes, of course, have very long antennae and a rear pair of legs that looks like back antennae, um, while millipedes have very short antennae. And you can find these guys just about anywhere in the world. Uh, in fact, there are even centipedes that live within the Arctic Circle, which is pretty yeah. incredible for an <laughs> arthropod. Um so th this first December news story concerns millipedes and their rather misleading name. So millipede is Latin for thousand feet, but until now, we've never known of any millipedes that actually had a thousand feet. Mm -hmm. uh, the then current record holder was uh, Ilacme plenips from central California, which sported 750 legs at maximum. And this belonged to the clade Siphonophorida, which is one of 16 clades of millipedes. And these are distinguished by their elongated bodies. Well, elongated for a millipede. But uh, thanks to Paul E. Merrick and colleagues, we can now say that we have a millipede species that actually sports a thousand legs. 
or rather 1,306 legs. Um, so everyone meet Eumilips Persephone from Western Australia, who is a member of the Polyzonida clade, who are typically known for being uh, kind of squat, pudgy little things. <laughs> But at 95.7 millimeters long and 0.95 millimeters wide, and sporting 330 body segments, um, as you can see in the image here, uh, Eumilipes persevenes looks more like an earthworm than a millipede. Right. Um, and that's because the limbs are really tiny. But they do serve a purpose. So the authors found this species by looking into the geological drill holes of a mineral mine in the eastern gold fields. And it seems that this millipede fancies living in cryptic underground environments. Now, Eumilipes Persephone uses its short legs to navigate the micro-caves, as they're called, where it lives, allowing them to push through the sediment with greater ease. So animals that live this way are called troglophiles, or cave lovers. Uh, I could have easily made an avatar joke, but I decided against it. Hmm. Um, <laughs> but uh, in the spirit of good humor, the authors did name the species after the Greek goddess Persephone, which should be self-explanatory. Uh, now, what's especially neat about this part of the world is that it has been little explored by scientists. The troglophilic organisms are becoming increasingly well-known and are revealing some amazing adaptations to living underground. Uh, the deepest living animal in the world currently is a nematode word. Uh, Halicephalobus mephisto, which was found in the ores of gold mines in South Africa, up to 3.6 kilometers underground, able to survive temperatures of 37 degrees Celsius. They are asexually reproducing, they eat bacteria, and they withstand incredible pressure. So, if we're finding critters like that, you know, just imagine what secrets the eastern gold fields may hold. Mm hmm. Um, the authors speculate that we could be dealing with a, a brand new biodiversity hotspot completely underground, of which the first true millipede is a pioneering discovery. So that is just amazing. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Albert. Yeah, that, that's an incredible find. And, oh, it, it is so tantalizing that this might be a new biodiversity hotspot, too. I, I can't wait to see what people find there and uh yeah like <laughs> wow th th this is this is really cool and uh it, it is kind of ironic now because you know kind of the classic stock way in which millipedes are introduced when you know you're talking about them in educational context is to say that the name millipedes means a thousand legs but there aren't any millipedes with this number of legs and, and and yet now we do have one that has over a thousand in fact and, and so yeah wow this is going to take a lot of rewrites and i, I think uh, uh people are going to have to unlearn uh, quite a few habits uh, these are people who talk about millipedes that is um so yeah th this is this is really really cool and I, I'll, I'll add that there is a really um, sort of funny figure in this uh, paper, uh, which I, I believe is open access, so anyone can go check it out. And of course, as always, we'll link it in the description. Um, and that is the phylogeny figure of, of this paper, uh, where they're showing the relationships between the different millipedes. And um, <laughs> next to the branches, they show uh, silhouettes of all the different uh, millipedes um, in the tree. And... <laughs> They, I think they show them like basically proportionate to one another, and so the, the, um, the silhouette for Eumilipes is really, really long compared to everyone else, and it's just, it's just <laughs> really funny. <laughs> oh yeah, um, it definitely is open access, and you can check it out. Um, oh, I, I, I thought about putting that on the slide, but I thought against it. Right, right. Um, but it is really hilarious. Uh. Because, like, yes, as far as millipedes are concerned, I mean, I think this is about the lengthiest that they can get. Mm -hmm. um, like, if, if you were, like, squinting, you, you couldn't even really tell it was a millipede, um, <laughs> which is just amazing. I mean, the, the, the extreme lengths of adaptation that, you know, um, troglophilic organisms will undergo in adapting to their environments. I mean, they, they, 
they look completely bizarre. Like, you want to talk about, like, aliens on Earth, you know, you, you got to look at some of these guys. <laughs> I mean, I think about the organisms that, that live in caves, for example. You have the, uh, like, the Olm, which is yes. a, a salamander, but it's, like, completely bleached. It has no eyes. Um, or either that or, like, the eyes are, like, pretty much, like, useless, and they're, like, right. enclosed in skin. Yeah. I think it's the latter. Um and they have these like these big jaws for eating, um, and yeah, like it's it's because they they live in darkness for all their lives. You know, they don't need to be colorful. They don't need to see. Um, they can get around just fine. Um, and like they're like a, a shalottles. They they retain their their gills in their adult form. So they 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 look. They're like the Peter Pans of salamanders. Um, and of course, that that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of, of organisms like this. Um, you know, one thing I will add before we, we move forward, mm. um, now we have, we, we might have to think about a new goalpost. Mm. So, um, another translation for Myriapod is 10,000 legs, <laughs> because, uh, Myrius is basically a, a Greek term for, for 10,000, which apparently in my research is like the biggest number they could think of. Oh, okay. yeah. If, like, to have a word for their language, um... So hey, if we can find that ten thousand legged myriapod of some form, then then we'll really be in business here. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh gosh, I can't even imagine. I don't even think anything on Earth has so many legs. Um, <laughs> right. It, it's just fascinating to me. I mean, I guess I don't know. Like, would would Celia kind of be <laughs> like legs, or right. would that be more accurate to say that something different? I I probably would consider them different, but uh, yeah, I guess they they are locomotory organs, I guess. <laughs> right, right. They 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 they're not legs, but they do kind of what legs do mm. in a weird way. Right. Um, they're underwater legs, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I love this paper. Um, and uh, if there's anything else you wanted to add, uh we can move on to your first story here yeah sure uh yeah not not much to add except to say that you know it just goes to show uh how much more we have to discover out there um now uh my first story is also about the about a new species or we're giving a, a new species a lot of love in this episode um so this one is a new dinosaur um called uh stego Uros. Um, and it is an ankylosaur, uh, so it's one of those armored dinosaurs, and it was discovered in the late Cretaceous of Chile. Um, and it is notable for a number of reasons. So first of all, it is known for a nearly complete skeleton. So the diagram here, you can see the schematic um, uh, skeletal diagram shows you what has been found of this animal. And it's pretty much most of the body. Uh, you know, it's got most of the skull, it's got many of the vertebrae. Um, and it's got much of the limb skeleton as well. Um, so it's known from a very complete specimen. Um, and uh, it is uh, pretty clearly an ankylosaur. However, um, the its body, uh, so the, the head has most of the more um, kind of technical ankylosaur features. Um, but uh, the rest of its body in some ways actually resembles um, stegosaurs, actually. Um, and so it seems to be sort of representing a sort of transitional kind of um, uh, morphology uh, where uh, the the skull is more ankylosaur-like or typical ankylosaur-like, but it's probably retaining a more ancestral uh, body form. Um, and uh, in their phylogenetic analysis, the researchers uh, found that it was probably closely related to um, some other ankylosaurs from the southern hemisphere, uh, named the Antarctopelta from the late Cretaceous of Antarctica, and Cumbarosaurus uh, from the early Cretaceous of Australia. Um, and so the authors actually give this group of ankylosaurs a new name uh, called Parankylosauria, meaning next to the ankylosaurs. And so that, that's meant to go with another new name they coin. Um, and so uh, they call the other uh, more typical ankylosaurs, which seem to form a clade, uh, you ankylosauria, the true ankylosaurs. So both pair ankylosauria and you ankylosauria are 
ankylosaurs, but they're kind of these two separate lineages within the group, at least according to uh, the analysis here. Um, and so we have this weird group of uh, southern hemisphere ankylosaurs uh, that are the sister group to the more typical ankylosaurs that we uh, tend to uh, are, are more familiar with. Um, but probably the most unusual feature of Stegouros is its tail. And so its tail, uh, you can see pictured on the um, the right here, though in the lower right corner, taking up really much of the right side of the figure, um, is showing the tail in top view. And on the end of its tail, you can see that the bony plates here uh, have form an interesting structure. So there are these flattened bony plates that kind of project out to the side um, of the tail. Uh, that forms a sort of uh, almost frond-like uh, feature. Um, and so almost certainly this structure was being used as a weapon, basically similar to a club. Um, but it is very different from the tail weapons that we have previously found in other types of armored dinosaurs. So of course, stegosaurs are famous for having spikes on their tails, or these cone-shaped, um, you know, armor uh, structures uh, lining the sides of their tail and they can swing them back and forth to kind of stab and uh, slash at their enemies. Um, whereas uh, the ankylosaur rids, which are a subgroup of you ankylosaurs, yeah, I know <laughs> names are uh, uh, confusing and also interesting to learn if you're in in interested in these animals. Um, but uh, yeah, ankylosaur rids, uh, which are a type of you ankylosaur, uh, and they include things like the famous ankylosaurus, for example, um, often have uh, tail clubs at the end of their tail, which are uh, formed out of several uh, round uh, bony bony plates that are uh, at the very end of the tail, so they form what we call a tail club. And the, the rest of the tail in ankylosaurids tends to be very stiff, so they can kind of swing their tail club like a baseball bat and probably uh, to devastating effect. Um, whereas uh, Stegouros had this uh, very different kind of tail weapon where the, uh, the it forms a, a sort of a club, but it's not like a rounded club at the end of the tail like you see in an ankylosaurid. In fact, it is um, uh, quite similar to a Mesoamerican weapon uh, called the Makwawit. Um, I'm not sure if I was quite saying that saying that quite right, but uh, uh, I, I think that I think that's closer to how you're supposed to say it. Um, and uh, this is basically a spiked club. Um, and uh, yeah, this this tail uh, does look a lot like uh, like that weapon. Um, and in fact, the authors like this is this is not just a, an observation that I randomly made. Like the authors specifically suggest that we should be calling this uh, structure in this animal, a makwawi. And, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, uh, in interesting uh, bit of uh, terminology there. Um, and so it is, it is such a wicked looking, looking animal. Um, now, interestingly, this is not a huge dinosaur. So uh, Stegouros is actually quite small for an ankylosaur. It is somewhere around two meters long or slightly smaller than that. And so, uh, yeah, this is this is not an absolutely massive uh, creature like some of the some of the ankylosaurids were. Um, nonetheless, uh, you know, it, it's plenty big enough that if you, a person were to encounter it, yeah, I think you would want to stay well away from that tail. Um, and uh, some people have uh, said things like that. They they were disappointed to find out that Stegouros is so small because they can't show it fighting like huge, <laughs> gigantic theropods. But um, like a weapon doesn't need to be effective against the biggest predator in your environment to be to to be uh, useful to an animal. Um, and I, I suspect that. Uh, to a large theropod, I would guess that Stegouros was something that they could take down, but wouldn't really be worth it. It would be like very, you know, it's covered in armor plates and like e even if it can't seriously injure you with the tail, it would still hurt to be like kind of slashed in the face by it. <laughs> so like, yeah, I, I think it, it would be something kind of similar to a porcupine uh, in modern day where the predators aren't, even if they're much bigger than it probably uh, might might choose more often than not not to mess with it just because it's too much pain for not not much of a meal. Um, yeah, so uh, such a cool looking animal, and it goes to show that we don't really know that much about the 
the kind of Mesozoic ecosystems in the Southern Hemisphere for the most part. Uh, like we, we haven't found that many um, Mesozoic dinosaur fossils from Chile, for example. And so uh, I think the more we discover there, uh, the more weird and unexpected things that we'll find. Of course, uh, Chilesaurus, which is one of the, uh, one of the few other um, Mesozoic Ch Chilean dinosaurs that we know of uh, is itself a very weird dinosaur, but uh, this is uh, not, uh, I suppose we, we probably shouldn't go on that tangent just yet because uh, we would be aged here for ages. But yeah, uh, really cool Stega Uros. Um, I would say very probably like the, the coolest new dinosaur to come out of 2021. Uh, yeah, the amazing find. <laughs> yeah, I um. I agree with you there. It's uh, it's it's funny you mentioned Chilesaurus. Like, yeah, not to not to get too into it, um, but I ha there's been a lot of response to this discovery. Um, some people saying that this is basically like the next Chilesaurus, or the, <laughs> uh, the next Ichi. You know, just being a, a, a weird dinosaur that nobody expected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, I've also seen comments that this is like a pokemon dinosaur um, <laughs> I, I, I can kind of see it right um yeah, the macaweedle analogy is really interesting um those are those are fascinating weapons in and of themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, essentially these giant um giant giant wooden planks with obsidian blades stuck to the ends of them and uh the contemporary accounts have a lot of praise to these things apparently they could like cut a horse in two oh, in seconds um i i think that's very exaggerated mm -hmm. but um, these are like notoriously like efficient weapons right um and i remember learning from trade the explainer that there are like next to none of them left in the world today huh. like um, of course being made of wood and obsidian right. you know, they're they're easy to decompose over time if they're not cared for um but I understand there are at least two left, um, both of them in museums, and one on display without the obsidian blades. Um, and of course, the thing is like uh, two meters long. Wow. Um, so it may have been like for more like construction purposes, I think, yeah. or or just like overkill. Um, I forget the specifics. Um, but like I'm looking at the tail, and I'm like, yeah, I, I can see that, even if you know this is not like. You know, maximum defense 101 will take down a, a an ankle or two. I I, I still wouldn't want to get whacked by this. No. Thing. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's a really impressive animal. Um, definitely does kind of bridge the gap between stegosaurs and ankylosaurs a little bit, even if not like, even if it's not supposed to. Right. You know, in in, in the way that like, scutellosaurus or scolidosaurus is supposed to. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, it definitely it's a fresh face in this group of animals um especially since you know growing up i'm familiar with ankylosaurs and i'm familiar with notosaurs and uh um i wouldn't know where to put something like this yeah. so it's <laughs> it's definitely a a curious animal for sure um yeah the, the i was gonna ask you about that the the southern hemisphere continents you know the, the gondwanan dinosaurs like that definitely is kind of prime real estate right now for mm -hmm. yeah paleontologists isn't it yeah definitely lots of weird finds are coming out of there and i'm sure there'll be many more <laughs> yeah because i remember uh i used to have dinosaur atlases growing up and uh of course these were printed back in like the 80s or 90s and uh south america got the short stick in a lot of ways mm -hmm. um which is because like they just weren't finding a lot of dinosaurs there right around right. 80 dinosaurs i should say um but now i mean there's plenty of, of of room for all the sorts of weird dinosaurs that we've been finding there i mean just just at the turn of this of of, of the of the century we've had you know giant titanosaurs and 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 giant allosaurs and the the, the cacarodontosaurids for example um things like a margosaurus which is uh, i still am trying to wrap my head around every <laughs> now and then um and then of course we have like even newer things like chilesaurus and stegouros yeah which and um last month we talked about berthosaurus so that's another weird south american dinosaur that's but, right yeah. yeah um uh that's fascinating yeah i, I always love I love new dinosaurs, 
and I especially love the new dinosaurs if they're like sufficiently weird enough to be just new aesthetically too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, not not to rip on any of the other dinosaurs, but there's only so many new titanosaurs with like a vertebrae and some teeth where it's like, oh, that's cool, but I, mean, <laughs> I don't I don't have like a visual cue to this thing. Right. Um, I mean, like a, a near complete skeleton. I mean, that is that is beautiful. That is really great preservation mm -hmm. on all of these bones. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Um, all right. Uh, if there's uh, if there's anything else you'd like to mention about this, uh, we can move on to my second stories. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so kind of a parallel to um, 2021 roundup. Uh, this is technically two stories um, that were released in December, but they, they fit together so well. And the implications of both are really interesting that I figured it would be important to talk about them here. So, a, uh, a frequent theme in our discussions of human origins is the increasingly earlier evidence we've been finding for environmental modification by humans. Now, regarding our own species, Homo sapiens, you know, we have sites in Australia and Borneo and East Africa dating back over 40 to 92,000 years that show evidence of large-scale burnings and active hunting of large game. There's a general understanding among many researchers that Homo sapiens seems to have a, a monopoly on the sorts of anthropogenic impacts mm. that we find commonplace in the world today. I mean, the ethnographic record is certainly full of it. Um, what has been a matter of debate is whether other species of hominins were capable of these sorts of environmental modifications. Mm -hmm. Um, evidence of long-distance hunting has been proposed for erectine-grade hominins, and there was one 2013 study by Lars Wordland and Margaret Lewis, which hypothesized that the loss of giant African predators like macarodonts and hyenas between two and one and a half million years ago may have been because of niche competition with early hominins. Um, we definitely know that Neanderthals and their ancestors were hunting big game animals in not insignificant numbers. Um, the site of Spy in Belgium shows evidence of Neanderthals seeking out mostly juvenile mammoths, taking away their skulls and likely processing them to get at the brain fat. Um, and there appears to have been multiple ways of coordinated hunting by spear using Neanderthals of horses at Schoningen in Germany. Um, and then there's the site of Moran in France, which may contain the bones of thousands of bison that were likely corralled and killed off by Neanderthal hunters. However, uh, it has been argued by some that Neanderthals behaved more like the megafauna they hunted mm. than Homo sapiens, in that their demographic size, environmental impact, and hunting techniques were not large enough to inflict the sorts of long-term changes that our species is known for. And this has also been argued to be a key factor that led to the extinction of the Neanderthals around 40,000 years ago, but having been outcompeted by our fast-growing populations and extractive environmental practices. So enter Will Roenbrokes and colleagues who have presented potential evidence that Neanderthals living in northern Germany around 125,000 years ago were engaging in the same sort of landscape management that Homo sapiens is known for, setting fires to open up the landscape for resource use. So the site complex studied here is Newmark Nord, which was known to have been empty of people due to the expansive ice sheets until the Eemian interglacial period, around 130,000 years ago, in which conditions became so much more bearable for humans to live in. Neanderthal activity in this area in particular is known to have been more active than at other sites, uh, having left abundant animal remains and heaps of stone tools um, at, at just one archaeological level. About 200,000 flint artifacts have been recovered. And this suggests that the Neanderthal presence here was year-round, almost sedentary, and perhaps consisted of a higher density population than at other neighboring reasons. Life seemed good here, and the Neanderthals took advantage of that. As is known for Homo sapiens, the longer a presence in one region, the greater chance 
for increased exploitation of resources. Uh, we have evidence of fire use here by Neanderthals as well, uh, including burned and charred items of wood, bone, and stone, and the relation of charcoal sources to specific, um, specific artifacts supports the observation that the fires here were human-made. Uh, as you can see in the chart to the left, there is a notable spike in charcoal around lithological unit 6, uh, which corresponds with a drop in deciduous tree pollen and a spike in herbaceous pollen. And this presence is maintained for some 2,000 years. Now this is very characteristic of foraging behaviors among humans in recent times, where people clear woodlands to make them more open, thus encouraging the growth of particular plants that they favor, and ensuring that certain animal species flourish for their benefit. For Neanderthals, we know that they ate acorns and hazelnuts, which are found to be among the types of plants that increased in number following the fires. So if managed well, these fires would have provided the affluent Neanderthals with easily available food for a long period of time. Hmm. So the authors surveyed the surrounding landscape as well, and they noticed the lack of a consistent wildfire pattern that could also be used to explain this open landscape. And this makes it all the more likely that the fires found at Newmark Nord were made by Neanderthals engaging in landscape modification. However, the authors chose to remain neutral about this for a very important reason. Uh, and they state that no matter how fine-grained in geological time, this is not fine enough to establish whether Neanderthals moved into the area because it had opened up through natural fires, as for example reflected in the charcoal record, or whether the initial suppression of woody vegetation was in fact caused by Neanderthal burning activities. It is the time average dimension inherent to archaeological data it causes such equifinality issues, even in a high-resolution site like Newmark Nord. Mm. And now, what that means that is, in trying to correlate the dates of the charcoal spike with occupational records, the authors were only able to get within 45 years of a plus or minus range, which does not make for a 100% perfect link. Um, while there is a close match of 2,000 years between the charcoal spike and the long-term activities of Neanderthals, especially compared to other reasons, um, it may be that we cannot necessarily explain it by natural fires themselves. So this is a bit tricky. You know, maybe this is evidence of Neanderthal landscape modification, or maybe it's a red herring. But it gives us something to examine closer, and a chance to do more precise work on this site, to be sure. Mm -hmm. um, and that's incredibly important, because if this is confirmed, well, there are some pretty big implications here. You know, mainly the recognition that Neanderthals are indeed capable of the sorts of anthropogenic changes that our own species is famous for. So uh, I'm very interested in seeing where this research goes. Yeah. Now... Yeah, uh, on a related note, if we may jump to the next slide, mm -hmm. um, hearkening back to my comments about pre-sapiens hunting of megafauna, we have this other study by Jacob Dembitzer and colleagues that provides a very curious record of hunting activities across one and a half million years in the Levant. So... Yes, we're going to talk about megafaunal extinction again. <laughs> it should be fun. <laughs> um, I did want to elaborate a teeny bit about the losses of Africa's megafauna first, uh, because I think those tend to be underplayed in this discourse, mm. and they're related here to an extent. Simply put, if you look around the world today at all the large mammals and birds that still survive, barely in many cases, uh, you find that Africa stands out in the number of megafauna. Uh, we briefly mentioned the Pleistocene fauna of Africa in episode 8 of Humanity, a prologue, uh, having included a number of bizarre species that had died out during that time, like the, the giant buffalo, Pelivornis, and the giraffe relative, Shivatherium. 
Now, humans, of course, have had a sustained presence in Africa for longer than anywhere else. I mean, we evolved there, of course. And that means that as our ancestors became better acquainted with hunting big game and hunting them efficiently, they're open to the possibility of impacting species numbers. So while direct evidence of human hunting on these species is lacking for the most part, their contributions to their extinctions seem to fit better with the data than a purely climatic explanation, as many of these species made it through several environmental changes mm -hmm. without significant harm done. Uh, with the possible exception of Southern Africa, where the transition from open grasslands to closed shrublands may have played more of a decisive hand, but this is debated. What is striking about the megafaunal extinctions of Africa is that they begin to rise long before the evolution of Homo sapiens. Uh, these go back about 2.8 million years in some cases, which has opened questions about what sorts of roles non-sapiens hominins like Homo ergaster might have played. Um, we know that power scavenging becomes commonplace in the archaeological record by 2 million years ago. And by 1 million years ago, do we find evidence of ambush hunting, which is also around the time that we start to see the first evidence of fire use. So hominins were in a position to impact megafaunal species at an early date, with some being driven to extinction over time, and others learning to adapt to the hunting pressures, while still others have moved in to overtake the niches opened by the lost species. And this way of life could have persisted as humans began to expand their populations into Eurasia and beyond. And this is where Dimbetser et al. comes in, by looking at the southern Levant, one of the earliest regions of Eurasia where humans first began their expansion. So there, the authors consulted a wide range of archaeozoological literature looking at kill sites, from the Pleistocene starting one and a half million years ago, and ending with the wider application of agricultural technologies at ten and a half thousand years ago. And they cataloged the weighted mean body mass of each species of mammalian megafauna, as well as medium-sized mammals and the larger species of tortoises and snakes. Uh, no, they did not include birds in this study. Hmm. Um, because it turns out a lot of archaeozoological archeo remains of birds are poorly labeled. Yeah, <laughs> um, Many of them only go so far as to say this is a bird. <laughs> right? not, not really helpful. Um, and so they also got the, the stratigraphic layer they were excavated from, the dates of those layers, and then what types of stone tool technology was associated with the kills. And here they use the admittedly controversial method of tying specific artifacts to hominin species which, as we've explained in the series before, has shown to be a more complex situation. And this brings the total to 83 species across 133 stratigraphic layers within 58 archaeological sites. And they had plunged all of this data into a linear regression chart, which you can see here to the left. And right away, you can see that there's been a sustained drop in megafaunal body mass mm. over the ages with larger species like elephants, hippos, and cattle gradually being whittled away as smaller species like deer, gazelles, and tortoises become more commonplace prey items. There was also a notable decline in megafaunal abundance at the beginning of this time frame, which tends to occur, and we call this defaunation. So between 400 and 125,000 years ago, elephants and their relatives actually died out in the southern Levant while hippos underwent their first regional extinction by 42,000 years ago, and they ended up coming back here a little bit later. Um, and then rhinos going out about 15,500 years ago. In fact, the auroch is the only mega herbivore to hold out by the end of the study period. Uh, they didn't die out in the Levant until the Iron Age. So within all this time, the average faunal composition changed from the early Paleolithic, so the age of the erectine hominins living in the area, uh, the main representatives of the large mammal fauna were elephants, cattle, and horses. In the Middle Paleolithic, so the age of mostly Neanderthal occupation, uh, the fauna mainly comprised of cattle, horses, and deer. And by the Late Paleolithic, so when Homo sapiens really began to spread out in this region, 
This had been whittled down to mainly smaller mammals with a muted presence of deer and gazelles. Now, these are very interesting trends, and while it must be stressed that hominins would have been hunting both large and small animals during their lives, the decline of large mammals is the most prominent observation here. Although with their loss, humans would have gradually begun to work their way through the smaller species too. And we do know that exploitation of animals like tortoises and hares actually increased by the end of the Paleolithic mm -hmm. because there were no longer as many large animals to go after. And these long-term changes are also reflected in the tool technologies because as you know, they would have been based around hunting small to medium-sized animals to better catch these swifter, easier hiding species. And what's interesting, tying all of this together, we do have previous studies that seem to confirm similar trends having uh, occurred in Europe from one million years ago, as well as various sites in Africa from roughly two million years ago and, and, and earlier. Um, of course, the losses in the Americas and Oceania, of course, tended to correlate more with the expansion of Homo sapiens into those mostly depeopled or unpeopled regions. Um, but the active elimination of larger mammals long before the rise of our species is a curious observation from the mm -hmm. study because it adds further weight to the idea that Homo sapiens isn't alone in causing defaunations and extinctions through continued hunting, as well as to the idea that megafaunal extinctions do not necessarily need to be rapid overkills. But remember, we explained earlier regarding the survival of woolly mammoths in the Arctic. There would have been an extended period of coexistence where human hunters would have only needed to take out a few individuals of a given species of elephant or rhino every generation or so, and that would have been enough to cause problems, as megafauna are very vulnerable to um, various sorts of issues because they, they breed slow and they breed few. Mm -hmm. um, so this study only adds a new dimension to that. If we are to understand that the megafaunal extinctions were mainly human affairs, you know, it may be time to consider other species besides our own as capable culprits. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have both Neanderthals potentially using fires to open up landscapes and erectines paving the way for megafaunal extinctions. Wow. Um, were you expecting anything like this, Albert? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so both of these are definitely really um, fascinating studies. Uh, I, I do think like the, the caution that the authors expressed in the Neanderthal study seems pretty well founded, but um, uh, I think it's certainly some very tantalizing, um, some very tantalizing findings. Um, and yeah, I would say I wasn't entirely expecting uh, such conclusions or at least uh, possible tentative suggestions to be to be made uh, but it, you know it certainly doesn't seem out of the question to me that the neanderthals might might have been actively um, shaping their their environments uh, in that manner so yeah i look forward to seeing what uh, what new research might be able to uh, shed light on on that subject um, and as for the uh, megafaunal extinction paper, yeah, um, it, like, you know, ob obviously it's not my field, but it does seem pretty suggestive to me, that uh, this evidence. And um, uh, I, I'll say um, I wasn't completely surprised uh, uh, by the implications here. Uh, I, I, I think I, I have heard of the idea that, yeah, maybe uh, kind of these megafaunal defaunation events might have started not just with homo sapiens but but with early hominins that, that is that is a hypothesis i have encountered before um so uh it, it didn't it didn't completely completely take me by surprise in that regard um however the fact that it we do seem to see such a strong trend um it, at least in this particular study uh, uh i think that that is really interesting and uh yeah, I, I I look forward to hearing what responses might might be made um, towards this um, because yeah, it, it does it does seem uh, fairly convincing to me. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, regarding the like the latter paper, like this is a phenomenon that's been observed with like 
aquatic organisms. Right, yeah. I forget what the actual term is, but, like, we have seen, like, archaeological sites, like, going way back in time, like, 500,000 years or more, where, like, the relative size of shellfish actually decreases mm. over time. Right. Because, yeah. you know, you want a tasty meal, you want to go after the big boys, and so like, the increased, like, collecting and harvesting of larger shellfish means that there's a greater chance of survival for the smaller shellfish, and they become more common over over the years as those uh, organisms evolve over time yep. to where it becomes harder and harder to find um big shellfish of course i as I, I believe we've alluded to in the final episode of humanity of prologue i mean we're seeing this today in recent times with large ocean fishes mm -hmm. you, know, yep. you know generations of fishermen going after like the one that got away you know like the big kahuna all these things mm -hmm. um and then, before you know it, it's harder and harder to find giant marlin, giant tuna, because there hasn't been enough time for those oceanic fishes to reach those sizes, yeah. <laughs> because they've just been harvested so much. Um, so, I, in terms of like the latter study, like I'm not surprised that we would see similar trends mm -hmm. with land animals, especially megafauna. Um, uh, Especially given like the the average number of like proboscideans, for example, across the Pleistocene, mm -hmm. there seems to be lesser and lesser as time goes on, even before the great population expansions of our species. Um, now, regards to the former paper, like, I do appreciate the caution that the authors put as well, because this isn't the first time that there's been a big like game changing study about Neanderthals. Only for later researchers to come in and say, well, actually. Right. Um, of course, the one everybody knows is um, Shanadar Neanderthals, which are also in the Levant, um, where you find these clearly buried, like intentionally buried bodies of Neanderthals um, and just all this pollen everywhere. And the researchers thinking, oh, they're taking bouquets of flowers or, right. or like handfuls of flowers and burying them with their dead. Um then other researchers later came in and were like, well, you know, the, the kinds of observations we're making, it seems more likely that small rodents or other burrowing creatures were messing with these graves and then taking in plants in their burrows and feasting on them there. And then that gives the illusion that the bodies were buried with these flowering plants. So... Whereas, like, in earlier books, that was all the rage. Nowadays, you almost never hear of that anymore because that study came out and there hasn't really been a major response to it. Hmm. <laughs> um, and now, granted, you know, Neanderthals, for lack of a better word, are becoming more human every year. Um, so, like, in terms of something like that, like, the capabilities of Neanderthals to look at these aesthetically pleasing flowers and bury them with their dead, like, it, it would make sense. Oh, yeah. Um like it, 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 that would totally be something they would be capable of, um, and I figured it would only be a matter of time before, you know, we're getting Neanderthals being landscape modifiers. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it, it, we're finally getting implications of that, right? Because um, I mean, really, as far as like dietary output, um, behavioral complexity, um, the, the the types of technologies that they were making, more and more people are coming around to the possibility that. There's really not a tremendous amount that separates Homo sapiens from Neanderthals mm -hmm. as far as like like life on Earth. You know, like uh, Neanderthals are were capable of just as complex behaviors and, and, and lifestyles as we were, um, and it would make sense that landscape modification of some sort would be an aspect of that, mm -hmm. especially for a place like uh, you know Newark Nord. Um, where, again, the big thing is, like, these are relatively affluent, sedentary Neanderthals, you know, living year-round in a place for many thousands of years, um, which is not something you usually hear about with Neanderthals. Usually they stay in a cave for a couple generations, then they leave, and new Neanderthals come back. Or they're doing, like, the nomadic hunter-gatherer thing. You know, they're going to and from places and not leaving a lot of remains, because, I mean... As far as archaeology is concerned, nomads are more or less invisible. Mm -hmm. You you really have to look for them in order to find a presence of them. So, 
yeah I, i'm definitely excited too um i have a feeling like we're going to be in for some really fascinating discoveries in the near future that and this is just the start of something like that mm -hmm. so um yeah that's all i really have to say about these um if there's uh if there isn't anything else that you wanted to touch on um we could go on to your last study here yeah, sure thing. And I think this is our final study uh, or story of the episode. Um, so, All yeah. right. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us. Uh, this is a long episode, but that's how yearly roundups tend to go. There's a lot to say. <laughs> mm. um, but yeah, in any case, this is a, this is a, our last study, and I think it's an extremely interesting one that came out like pretty much right at the end of last year. Um, and so this study is a, a study trying to estimate uh, when the different groups of mammals um, diverged from each other. And this is a really kind of hot topic in recent years for well over the last decade or so. Um, yeah, the last couple of decades, really. And uh, basically, uh, the timeline of like when the different groups of mammals uh, emerged has been very controversial. Um, especially concerning the origins of placental mammals. So, of course, the, um, all mammals alive today that aren't monotremes or marsupials. Uh, the kind of classic idea of um, when placental mammals originated is that uh, based on the fossil record, uh, from the fossil record, uh, we don't find uh, clear examples of placental mammals until after the cretaceous paleogene extinctions. We, we don't really have uh, specimens that everyone agrees are placentals uh, from the Cretaceous period, for example. And so uh, the classic idea, the traditional idea based on uh, this pattern we see in the fossil record is that placental mammals did not originate until uh, shortly after the Cretaceous paleogene extinction, at which point they diversified like crazy and evolved into all the forms that we see today. Um, however, when people started using the molecular clock method uh, to try and estimate uh, divergence times in uh, mammals, uh, we started finding some pretty contrasting results and several uh, kind of competing models were proposed. Um, and so the molecular clock method basically is uh, taking genetic sequences um, well, you can also use protein sequences too, but oftentimes it's genetic. Genetic sequences uh, from different organisms, and then you run them through a computer program, and then the comp computer program basically will uh, take the differences of the, between those sequences and uh, try and calculate, like, uh, okay, so how, uh, how long would it take for uh, all these differences to accumulate, um, and then try to estimate divergence times based on that. Um, but uh, a lot of things can influence molecular clock estimates. Um, you also have to put in like certain assumptions into uh, these analyses when you run them. And so, uh, you know, these uh, molecular clock analyses are not like an automatic silver bullet that you're automatically going to get like the correct answer uh, or anything like that. And so um, there have been several different contrasting uh, results that have come out of like different molecular clock studies in recent years. Um, and this is certainly a, a topic of great interest to me uh, because uh, I, I have brought, brought this up several times during the show, but I guess the, um, uh, in, in previous episodes of the show, but uh, I think I guess the, the episode where we probably focused most on discussing this was in the first episode of Dinosaurs, the second chapter, because uh, there's a very similar problem when we're trying to estimate the origins of modern birds. Um, we also don't have very many fossils of modern birds from uh, the Cretaceous period, um, but uh, molec some molecular clock analyses seem to suggest that there might have been quite a few lineages, lineages of modern birds already around them, and so, you know, well, what is going on? Um, and so uh, when people applied uh, molecular clock analyses to uh, mammals, um, some studies found that uh, Placental mammals might have been a lot more ancient than we had previous, previously assumed, where uh, with uh, them originating like deep in the Cretaceous and with many lineages having already originated then. And so like, could this be true? Like, could a lot of the uh, modern placental groups already have evolved by the Cretaceous and we just haven't, haven't found their fossils yet? So some of these analyses, like, they suggest that uh, there might have been like modern primates or... Um, 
like modern uh, rodents and carnivorans and hoofed mammals, like many of these modern groups might have already originated in the Cretaceous and just haven't been found as fossils. Um, well, uh, technically speaking, it's certainly possible. Uh, we do know that the fossil record is far from complete. Um, but even so, it would be pretty odd um, if all of these groups had originated before the Cretaceous and we haven't found their fossils or can't recognize them because they are pretty distinctive groups. Um, and we, it's not like we don't find any mammal fossils at the end of the Cretaceous, because we do. Uh, now, because most of the mammals from the Cretaceous are very small animals, we often don't find very complete fossils, but nonetheless, uh, we do find uh, fossils of mammals uh, from the end of the Cretaceous, and a lot of times we can get a pretty decent sense of what type of mammal they are, um, and yet we still don't uh, have uh, many or even any uh, clear examples of placental mammals in the Cretaceous uh, as fossils. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there, there, are, there are these kind of, um, between these two extremes, there also have been also been different suggestions of, of the time scale of placental mammal origins as well. Um, yeah, so between the option that all placental mammals originated after the Cretaceous versus like most of them had originated in the, in the Cretaceous, um, you, like pretty much like every possibility in between has also been suggested by various studies. Um, okay, so you know we have this controversy going on, um, and you can certainly make uh, theoretical arguments from for like many of these different options, but uh, how can we kind of get to the bottom of this? Well, um, a new study that came out late last year tried to kind of narrow this down. Um, see if we can get more accurate and more precise estimates of uh, the time scale involved. Um, and so what they found was that if we basically throw more data at the problem, we can get uh, more precise estimates of these divergence times. We can kind of narrow down the uncertainty for a lot of these divergences. Um, so they used a genome scale data set, so basically using much of like the entire genetic sequence of uh, of different mammals to try and uh, estimate the di divergence times. However, there is a problem with this, and is that if you have a lot of data in your analysis, then this can take huge amounts of time and computing power to try and run th those analyses in the first place. Um, and in fact, uh, the authors point out that if they had tried to run their analyses uh, using like uh, traditional methods of, of running these analyses. We, we don't have to go into those the, the detail about the computational stuff here, uh, partly because I, I wouldn't be the best person to explain them anyway, and partly because they're, yeah, they're kind of arcane. And basically, um, if if they were to use like the traditional methods of estimating divergence times, like it would have taken them something like over a hundred years or something to, to finish running the analysis. <laughs> so obviously that's not very practical. <laughs> Um, so they use some new methods of of, um, uh, of computing the, the divergence times here, um, and uh, part of that was they they um, had specific pipeline for uh, for running the analysis. So first they estimated these divergence times based on a smaller data set of just seventy two mammal species, um, and then uh, based on the results that they got from that, they use that to uh, kind of narrow down. Uh, the range uh, for their bigger data set, which had over 4,000 mammal species, which is, you know, most mammal species alive on Earth. There are, um, I think at the latest count, there are something like 6,000-ish uh, living mammal species. Mm -hmm. So 4,700 is a pretty damn good sampling of uh, modern mammal diversity. Um, and so uh, because they had already uh, gotten some narrowed down results from the 72 mammal data set, they could apply those to the uh, bigger data set, and that uh, helped reduce, uh, kind of streamline the, the process quite quite a bit. And so, uh, what they found um, uh, after uh, you know computing divergence times for the uh, 4,000 uh, over 4,000 mammal data set. Um, is shown here, uh, and I might add that they also um, what they did was they also broke up this four thousand uh, mammal tree into like several smaller trees and kind of estimated the uh, the divergence times for each of those separately, um, and so yeah, uh, then they kind of stitched them back together to see uh, what the kind of complete picture was, um, 
and so uh, what they found here, you can see that the uh, kind of grayed out area of the phylogeny uh, represents uh, uh, the Cenozoic, the more recent times. Um, and so this is a uh, phylogeny depicted in a circular diagram. And so the center is basically the root of the tree, the deep past, and then towards the outer edges of the circle are like modern day. Um, and so uh, the gray circle, uh, or the grayed out area, is the Cenozoic. So you can see the border between the grayed out uh, area and the inner white circle, that's the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And so what they found was that they found very strong evidence that placental mammals as a group did originate in the late Cretaceous. And specifically, uh, they estimated sometime between 83 to 77 million years ago is probably when placental mammals originated. Um, however, you'll notice here that uh, before the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, uh, only a few lineages of placental mammals had actually emerged. Um, so it's not like we had like modern type primates or carnivorans or hoofed mammals in, in the Cretaceous. The majority of these modern groups uh, still originated shortly after the uh, Cretaceous uh, paleogene extinction, um, according to, to their findings. And so, uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, basically probably the most significant kind of uh, of their results. Um, and uh, I think uh, it is pretty plausible. In fact, I, I think personally, just uh, based on what I know about molecular clock dating and about uh, the mammal fossil record, this might be one of the most plausible timescales for mammals that has you know, been proposed so far. And so um, there, there are basically a couple of alternative um, uh, models that this could support. Uh, so clearly it doesn't support the, the very traditional model that all placentals uh, originated after the Cretaceous. Um, and it also doesn't support a model where like a bunch of modern groups originated in the Cretaceous. Um, but it might support one model, which uh, it happens to be a model that I, I tend to favor called the soft explosive model, um, which is where uh, placental mammals did originate in the late Cretaceous but uh, had undergone only very limited diversification um, in the Cretaceous. And then it was only uh, after the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction that the majority, like the very explosive rapid radiation gave rise to the most of the modern groups. And that is pretty consistent with what they found here. Um, and so uh, this is also uh, pretty uh, easier to reconcile with the fossil record uh, compared to like models where a bunch of modern groups originated early. Um, because after all, um, it, if it was only a few uh, lineages around, then it makes uh, more sense that we maybe we just haven't found them yet or we haven't recognized them yet because uh, such early placental mammals, perhaps it would be very difficult to recognize them anyway uh, compared to like mammals that are closely related to placentals that are now extinct but were around in the Cretaceous. Um, whereas if you posit that a ton of modern groups that are already originated, then then you're also suggesting that they already had acquired all their distinctive like quote unquote modern features. And so uh, like the the idea that we have missed so many modern groups uh, that would supposedly be, be so distinctive uh, is, a, you know, not impossible, but it's a lot harder to kind of, it, it seems a lot less plausible on the surface, at least. Um, and uh, furthermore, uh, they also tested um, some alternative uh, phylogenetic hypotheses. So um, there are still some areas of placental phylogeny that are uncertain, um, that, that uh, that we're not sure about. Like there, some relationships could be one way or they could be another way. Um, in general, we have a pretty damn good handle on like the relationships uh, bit among placental mammals nowadays, but there are a few areas of contention. For example, uh, the relationship between um, uh, tree shrews versus primates versus rodents is still not entirely clear. Um, the traditional idea is that the tree shrews are more closely related to the primates, but um, there have also been some uh, genetic studies that have put the tree shrews closer to the rodents instead, um, or uh, putting them uh, equally close to rodents and primates. And so that, that's kind of an uncertain area. And so um, this study, um, they actually uh, tried to test uh, whether these alternative ideas um, changed um, what they inferred for the time scale. And it turns out um, 
Not really. Um, yeah, uh, most of the controversial aspects of placental phylogeny don't really impact the time scale that much. And what is probably going on there, um, the authors suggest, and is also backed up by other lines of evidence, is that uh, probably these areas of uncertainty um, occur uh, where these different lineages split from each other um, very quickly in time, in geologic time at least. And so uh, because there hasn't been much um, because they split so close to each other, essentially, um, it is very difficult for us to figure out uh, which groups are closely, more closely related to each other than others. Um, however, uh, this also means that uh, because they split apart from each other so quickly, that uh, putting them in different positions doesn't impact the divergence time estimate anyway, because it just happens so quickly. <laughs> like either way, it's a really, really short period of time. It doesn't doesn't change the time scale that much. Um, so yeah, that's that's good to know uh, that the that that uncertainty doesn't really impact um, the uh, the divergence time estimates. And so yeah, again, I, I think uh, this is a really um, impressive effort. Like just check out the amount of data they threw at it. Um, but also possibly one of the most you know, plausible. Um, proposals for the placental, um, not, not as placental, they've looked at other mammals too, the, the mammal evolution, the time scale of mammal evolution. Um, now, uh, since I'm not a mammal paleontologist, um, I haven't gone through and kind of looked at uh, their um, calibrations to see how, how um, you know, well supported they are. So uh, when, when you're doing um, molecular um, clock analyses, uh, basically it's Molecular clock analyses are based on like estimated uh, rates of how quickly um, you know, genetic mutations accumulate, um, but uh, you we do know that these uh, these rates do not stay constant over time, and so we have to calibrate them, as we say, um, using other types of data um, that other than kind of the genetics themselves. And usually uh, these calibrations are based on the fossil record. So you take like the oldest known member of a certain lineage, for example, and then tell the analysis, okay, we know that the oldest known fossil of this lineage um, occurred at this time. And so you have to make this lineage this old at least. Um, and that's often how a lot of molecular clock analyses work. And uh, usually you try and get as many calibrations um, as you practically can. Um, it, and, uh, and hopefully uh, that constrains your uh, estimates better. Um, however, uh, you have to be careful when you're choosing your calibrations because if you're using um, fossils that aren't actually members of that lineage that, you know, the evidence that they are members of lineage is not that strong, then you might be getting flawed results out of that because it may be the oldest known member of the of that group actually was not uh, that old, for example. So yeah, you have to be careful when you're when you're uh, choosing those calibrations, and and that can that can be a big source of like uh, a lot of these um, controversies about when certain groups originated um, is like the choice of calibrations. And, and so uh, since I'm not a mammal paleontologist, I, I haven't really gone in and looked at uh, how well supported the calibrations they chose are. And so it's possible that someone who is a specialist in mammal paleontology could go in and say, okay, they, they shouldn't have chosen that calibration. So maybe uh, someone should rerun an analysis with, with a different calibration or with that calibration removed um, and so forth. Uh, so yeah, I'm, again, I'm, I'm sure as always, this is not the last word on the subject. Um, but uh, I think, uh, to me at least, this is a really incredible um, study. And um, yeah, I, um, I hope someone uh, at some point can apply a, a similar method to look at uh, the problem with, the, with bird divergence times because uh, um, birds have a very, very similar controversy going on regarding uh, when uh, groups of modern birds originated. Um, and I suspect that the story is probably going to be turned going to turn out similarly to the placentals um, for reasons I mentioned in Dinosaurs, the second chapter. Um, but uh, yeah, basically, I, I suspect also that um, crown birds uh, did originate in the um, late Cretaceous. And in fact, we do have direct fossil evidence that they did. Um, however, that the, the diversification was probably pretty limited and that most of the modern groups originated afterward. But yeah, I, I would be really interested to see uh, something similar. Um, uh, to what they did here being applied to birds as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and all of that will build up, to, uh, you know, to add to our understanding of um, the origins of modern animals and also uh, how life uh, was impacted by major events like the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction. Um, yeah, do, do you have any thoughts about this? 
Oh gosh, yeah. Um, and this is this is a really remarkable study. Um, I, I'm I'm kind of laughing a little bit because, like, yeah, like the the incredible computing power needed to <laughs> yeah. run a, a software like this. Um, it, it's just amazing to consider, like, that just like the sheer amount of data needed, right? Because um, I know doing phylogenies with whole genomes. As I understand it, those tend to be the ones that are really favorable because the genome has like all the information. Right, right. Um, versus if you just had like nuclear DNA, for example, which is only part of the story. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, uh, um, you were talking about like doing a say like this with birds. Mm -hmm. I know that they had. Oh, you remember which of the phylogenies it was where they took bird genomes to look at the larger relationships? Yeah, like uh, there, there have been several Was like. That genome scale uh bird phylogenies but um uh, i think the the one that really uh focused on like whole genomes was uh, the jarvis et al uh, 2014 study i think oh that's the one yeah yeah right right um interesting because even then like there were still uncertainties mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. regarding like the relationships so oh, yeah. i think like you said yeah like just having more and more um data might uh I help clarify things in that front. Um, I would be very interested to see like what those results would be. Uh, I tend to agree with you, um, especially just given like the circumstances of the situation. Because I'm, I'm looking at this 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 chart here, mm -hmm. um, like having like the major groups diverge, and then it's only until like after the KPG that things took off the way they did. Right. Um, that sounds about right. And of course, like my biggest question is like, what would these animals have looked like? Yeah, um, I, I imagine they all would have been fairly shrewy mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. to some extent, but it's just like the varying levels of, of of divergence from each other. Because like these large groups, you know, Xenarthrans, Afrotherians, Laurasia Therians, Euroconic Liars, um, most of these are pretty new classifications anyway. Oh, yeah. um, and they're often more based on the genetics themselves than like looking at morphology. Mm -hmm. um, so it it would be a question of like if you found like an early um, Laurasia theory and like right. how would you know? Yep. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. how, how 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 could you tell based on like the skeletal anatomy anatomy um, that that's what you were dealing with? Um, which yeah, it's a that's a big question for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was curious because I, I don't know if you if you knew about this. So there's Figure A, which is like the big chart, mm -hmm. um, and then there's this Figure B. Um, uh, what's their definition for mammal here? Uh, as far as I know, yeah, I, I didn't I didn't specifically uh, uh, check that in the paper, but I I would assume that by mammal they mean crown mammals because. Uh, being a genetic study, they can only include like modern mammals, and so the the uh, the root that they label as mammalia here is the divergence between monotremes and all the other mammals, which would be the crown mammal um, oh. node. Yeah. Mm. Okay, because I was wondering if like they were using the looser definition to yeah. include like mammalia forms. Which... Right. Yeah, that's a good question. I know that's tricky. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if they did that for the for chart B, but uh, but yeah, de definitely in. Um, in the big phylogeny chart, the the mammal node there is crown group mam mammalia. Right, right. Um, a lot of interesting trends here on that little chart. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just I'm just a little bit drawn to it. Um, obviously, like our sampling will be limited in certain aspects, yeah. but it's interesting to see like just the general increase uh, later in the Cretaceous, mm -hmm. and then it just kind of like shoots from there. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, this is really interesting, just like just the relevance to like the things that I have read, because uh, if, if all of you remember, we had the update special for Humanity of Prologue, mm -hmm. and I talked, I, I went a little bit into this territory with one of the studies yeah. that I talked about there regarding Purgatorius. Oh yeah, um, which again, as, as, as you had mentioned, is a, is a bit of a, a bit of an enigma as far as like mammalian evolution goes, because mm -hmm. it's been called like the earliest stem primate. But they're pro they might not be primates at all. Right. Um, yeah, this is a really remarkable study. Um, I, yeah, I would love to see this done with other groups, um, birds especially. Mm -hmm. um, 
also, you know, things like uh, you know, lizards and frogs and, oh, yeah. and teleosts, of course, because oh, yes. uh, they all kind of underwent similar radiations like the mammals yep. for the KPG. And there's a lot of interesting questions that I'm sure people would like to ask mm-hmm. regarding their histories. Well, fantastic. Um, all right, then, uh, if there's something else you wanted to add about this um i guess that's that's it for our (laughs) 2021 roundup slash december 2021 news episode uh we we thank you all for joining us today um we'll go with our usual announcements here on the uh on the next slide so yeah just a reminder again uh we have been in the process of planning our first interview with uh, two great science communicators, Miles Greb and Trey the Explainer. Um, we are still in the planning stage of that because even with the turn of the year, they have been very busy. So we haven't been able to pick any specific dates yet. Uh, we're shooting for like early this year. And as always, we will keep you posted on that. And of course, if you have any questions you'd like to ask either or both of them, uh, please send them in. Uh, as always, we accept emails. We accept YouTube comments, and you can go on our Twitter and leave a comment there as well. And uh, we will try our best to get those in there as as best as possible. But uh, as I understand, we're both very excited to do this interview. <laughs> and we'll keep you updated as soon as we get any confirmations. So, of course, uh, we are on Patreon if you are interested in supporting us. Um, we have several tiers of donations you can bring in. And... Uh, contributions would help us continue the series and develop new projects and expansions um sort of a uh, an exciting update regarding our patreon we now have three patrons and now all of our patrons are of the tier for shout outs mm-hmm. so we have uh, my sister julie and our, our good friend denver who was our most recent patron as well as uh, our other patron paul who has left some very um interesting correspondence that uh, we'd like to get to at some point in the future mm-hmm. um we appreciate your support and we uh, we look forward to further developments down the line um as far as our other acknowledgements are concerned uh, we have our good friends henry and alicia we thank them for their contributions to the series henry of course made our wonderful theme music and alicia made the color scheme for albert's alvarosaur avatar which is just a delight <laughs> Um, now, of course, uh, we are on Twitter. You can follow us there for updates. We are at Time and Clades, uh, where we usually just post new episodes, and we accept correspondence there as well if you are interested. Um, of course, you are most likely watching us on our YouTube page through Time and Clades, so if you haven't already, but please feel free to subscribe and follow us. So you can get updates for future episodes. Um, if you have any questions for us regarding anything in this episode or anything in general, uh, please feel free to send them in. Uh, we have our email, timeandclades at gmail.com, as well as on our YouTube comments section and on our Twitter as well. And, of course, we have uh, extensive references in the description. Uh, you can check out all of the papers we've talked about today, as well as, like, related topics. And with that, that is it for Through Time and Clades, our first episode of the year. And here's to another full year of exciting new videos and and series um let's see well what do we have next Hmm. what's our next video well we are going to have our next review coming up yeah we're uh, we're hoping for a release next week um and this time we're going to do a film so we've done a book we've done a television series and now we're doing a film an animated feature film to be exact uh we're going to be reviewing the brand new Walt Disney Animation Studios film Encanto. And we're going to go into all the neat details about Colombia's history and culture and our thoughts about the film itself. So we look forward to doing that and uh, we hope you all look forward to it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but with that, that's it for the show. Thank you so much and we hope you have a very wonderful day and a very happy 2022. Indeed. Take care, everybody.